we'll, we'll, we'll talk soon. We'll talk soon. Have a good night, everybody. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ann. Night, Ann. Night-night. All right. So, Mark, I just have a couple more questions for you because, yeah. sure. as I said, right. your book, I loved it. It's called Everything I Need to Know I Learned in the Twilight Zone. And I just wanted to go over, because you, you went through so many episodes in each each life lesson that each episode had. And the first one is Nick of Time starring William Shatner. And I loved the lesson. It says, it doesn't matter if you can foretell the future. What matters is whether you believe more in luck and in the future than you do in yourself. Well, you can decide your own life. And I think a lot of his episodes dealt with that. Just believe in yourself and don't, you know, doesn't matter what anybody else says, similar to, uh, you know, the nightmare in 20,000 feet. And, yeah, uh, what, interesting. They both star Shatner and they were yes. both written by Richard Matheson. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, 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 that is a theme, you know, um, there is a, sometimes you can watch a Twilight Zone episode and you can almost thematically figure out who wrote it because, you know, there's, you know, somebody once said that, um, a lot of the episodes dealt with alienation and a sense of isolation. And, um, the assumption is that Rod was the one who brought that to the Twilight Zone and he wasn't, that was really Richard's theme. That was much, if you look at Richard Matheson's work, especially his early work, the notion of alienation, the, the one person up against the long odds or the being the ultimate outsider. I Am Legend. I Am Legend is completely about you know, the, the one man against an army of vampires. How, how alienated can you get? The shrinking man, the shrinking man, by somebody who is literally withdrawing. Uh, the story that became Steven Spielberg's first TV movie, Duel, which is one man up against this mechanized uh, threat, uh, the Night Stalker, which is you know uh, the the one reporter uh, against a, a whole uh, bureaucracy that doesn't believe him. Uh, so, and if you look at Richard's Twilight Zone episodes, the ones like The Invaders with Agnes Moorhead. Love that episode, yeah. You know, or Nightmare 20,000 Feet. There it is again. There's that, that notion of the one person up against the long odds. And well, uh, Another example would be, which I love, is uh, What Dreams May Come. And they made a movie with Rob Williams where he has to go to hell to save his wife and bring her right. back. It's like a man against all odds. And he's going to do it because he believes in love and that's his soulmate. Yeah, I, I've read many of his stories. I can't remember a lot of them by name because he has a, I have a book of a lot of his short stories. And I have, you know, his, the ones that were novels. And he is just a solid writer. And I'm so glad that you brought that up because I wanted to mention that about him being a storyteller and not just a horror author. Because there's yeah, I, so much more to him than that. You know, and again, it's, it's to appreciate Richard as a horror writer, you have to appreciate everything else he did and who he was and where it came from. Like, like I was saying, um, in fact, you know, Richard's writing was, was so good that Stephen King said that he was the writer who most influenced him. He, that, that Richard Matheson was the writer who taught him how to do it. And, you know, and, and Robert Block once said to me uh, that we were talking about advice that you might give to young writers. And Robert Block once said, uh, uh, you know, about the mechanics of writing, there's not much that can be said. But I would tell any person who wants to write, anybody who wishes to learn how to write, to do one thing, to read Richard Matheson. It's a hell of a thing to say, isn't it? When you're Robert Block and you're no slouch yourself. <laughs> what an amazing thing to say about another writer. And, uh, you know, and they were good friends. They were very, they were very dear friends. But yeah, Matheson was just one. And the thing is, you know, like Matheson and Beaumont came of age at the same time that Rod did. They were all roughly the same age. And, 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 Rich, and Richard, like Rod, had been in the war. He'd been in the European theater and had been in the Battle of the Bulge. And he had his own uh, war scars. But he went to college and majored in journalism uh, after the war. And then he turned to writing, but he comes of age with the magazines, the pulp magazines of the 50s, because you could sell, he was writing for amazing stories and amazing fantasy, while Rod was writing for live television. So they all came of age at the same time, they just got there and uh, by different avenues. And, the, and then they all kind of intersect, it's all leading to the Twilight Zone. They're all gonna intersect in the Twilight Zone. So, uh, and yes, I mean, you can, you, can, you can usually tell an Earl Hamner episode. 
you can usually tell, although, you know, there's, there's a couple episodes we think are, are like the last rites of Jeff Myrtlebank, which, you know, that's, that's Earl Hamner, isn't it? No, it's not. It was Montgomery Pittman, but uh, it, it sure feels like a, an Earl Hamner episode. One more thing about uh, Richard Matheson, because I've, well, I've seen Stephen King talk. I interviewed Owen King and I met Joe Hill and there's, I'm sure you know about the book, He is Legend, where different authors wrote their versions of Richard yes. Matheson stories. And I love the fact that Stephen King and Joe Hill wrote their version of Duel, which I think was called Full Throttle, if I'm correct. Yeah, I believe that's about right. The, yeah, the two, the father and son motorcycle, who had the motorcycle gang. But yeah, just the, the impact, again, just like a Rod Serling, Richard Matheson, Richard Matheson had such a huge impact on the world with his writing and the, you know, the movies they made from his writing. And like you said, you could tell, it's like, is this a Matheson story? I mean, if you know him well enough, you could tell, like, it seems like something Richard would write. Yeah, and they, uh, they all did contribute to the, uh, you know, to yeah. what was the Twilight Zone. It's like, you know, it, and it gets, kind of gets back to this branding thing that we were talking about before, is that there are a lot of people who want to, you know, sort of identify the Twilight Zone. What is the Twilight Zone? You know, you know, the easy thing and, and way overly easy has become for a lot of people to sort of label it a, a horror series. And it really wasn't. It, I mean, there, it, it had episodes which might fit into the category of horror. And other people have said it was science fiction, but really the Outer Limits was the science fiction show. And, and Thriller was the horror show. And I mean, I, I, the Twilight Zone is it, it's all of the above and none of it. It's, it, it was big enough to encompass science fiction, horror, fantasy, allegorical storytelling, all of it. It was all the above. It was none of it. It was the Twilight Zone. The best way to define the Twilight Zone is, is just to take the shortcut and say the Twilight Zone, all of these elements dash the Twilight Zone. And Rod was right, right? It turned out that Rod was absolutely correct. It was as, you know, as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. Uh, that's exactly what it was. It was big enough to incorporate all of that. And I, you know, because if it had just been a horror show, it would, we wouldn't have as many avenues into it. We wouldn't have as many fans of it. it the fans would be limited to people who are horror fans. Horror fans remember Thriller with great affection, but very few other people do. You know, as much as few people remember, and Thriller was a great show. I mean, was, uh, Robert Block wrote many of the great horror episodes, and it was Boris Karloff was the host. Uh, I mean, it was a great show, you know, and, and Outer Limits was a, was a fantastic, very important science fiction show. But the people who watch The Outer Limits tend to be science fiction fans, and the people who watch Thriller tend to be horror fans. The Twilight Zone sort of gets everybody, and you don't have to even be a fan of genre storytelling to like The Twilight Zone. So you mentioned it, how many people that are in the business today were influenced by a Twilight Zone. Not all of them are in sci-fi. Not all of them are in horror. The people that you mentioned are doing TV, but has nothing to do with horror sci-fi. And they're doing, and they said, no, I was definitely influenced by a Twilight Zone. That was one of my favorite shows growing up. So yeah, I agree with you. I think Twilight Zone is, is its own genre. It's not horror. It's not sci-fi. Yeah. Like you said, it's all and, and none. That's a perfect I, way to put it. And, and why do you have, I mean, I do this exercise with my students um, at Kent State, could you sort of talk about, you know, this kind of com this compulsive American need to label something. And I put up two words on the board. And I just put up the words Jurassic Park. <laughs> and I draw a line and underneath I put, you know, horror, science fiction, fantasy, adventure, <laughs> action, then which is it what, what what do you think jurassic park is you know and invariably there's a there's a there's a few students who get it who basically say all of the above yeah it, it is all of the above it is it doesn't have science fiction elements it certainly does does it have horror elements it is basically the whole thing is structured as a horror story it's 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 the haunted house conceit what is the haunted house it's an isolated environment in which a limited number of characters are locked in and have to deal with something that periodically jumps out and goes boo at them. Well, in this case, the haunted house is an island and the things jumping out is not ghosts, but dinosaurs. But the whole structure and conceit is that of the haunted house. And so does it fit horror? Yes. Is it action adventure? You bet it is. Is it all of those, these things? Yeah. And thank goodness it is. 
thank goodness that, that, that it, why do we have to pick one and just say, this is it, that this is what it is. Michael um, Crane's another perfect example of somebody who's not stuck in one genre. I mean, I've read all of his books and each book is completely different for the most I'm part. I'm sorry, who did you no, say? Michael, Michael Crane. Oh, Michael Crane, yeah. I yeah. said, he's another one that you can't put, put into one genre. He's not just horror, he's not sci-fi, just like every story is different. He's another one that you get a lot of lessons out of his stories. I'm sure if you talk to him, he would say he grew up watching The Twilight Zone, reading his stories. Absolutely, you know, and again, in The Twilight Zone, and not just The Twilight, but Rod Serling. Yes. Rod Serling is sort of a heroic writer. He's the role model. He's the one, you know, if you ask uh, Vince Gilligan, who did uh, Breaking Bad, if you ask David Chase, who did The Sopranos, if you ask Matt Weiner, who did Mad Men, you know, ask all these guys, who is your hero? Who is, who is your, they're, they're all going to say Rod Serling. Now, we take it for granted that the influence in genre storytelling is immense. But none of those shows is genre. None of those shows is horror, science fiction, or fantasy. So the influence of The Twilight Zone is immense, and it extends well outside of the realms of what we think The Twilight Zone is. And, you know, Rod has another major impact on television and television history, which is, and he's kind of side by side. There's another fellow who, who also does this. And he's doing it at the exact same time on another CBS show, which is one of the most acclaimed shows on television at that time, which is Carl Reiner on The Dick Van Dyke Show. Carl Reiner and Rod Serling are kind of the, the prototype for what's going to become the modern showrunner, hyphenate writer, producer. The person who says, this show is basically a reflection of me as a writer and to protect that, I am also going to be the executive producer. I'm going to be the showrunner. That's what Rod did on The Twilight Zone and it is what in, 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 in drama and that's what Carl Reiner did on the comedy side of the street with The Dick Van Dyke Show. And that's what all these writers are today who, who control their own shows. So if, he also has an enormous impact on showing how, how the writer producer can be the auteur, if you will, to use a very fancy word. Uh, how they can become this, this, this person who absolutely shapes the world and controls the world that's there. So again, you just can't underestimate Rod Serling's uh, influence and impact. He definitely blazed that trail for everybody else that's here now. Absolutely. Everything he went through with the sponsors, trying to get his script onto the screen. So yeah, it's, without him, all those people, they have a lot to thank for to Rod Serling. I, I, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, and again, and you also, you, you always keep coming back to this, that he only lived to be 50 years old. This was all- no, That's amazing. All done, you know, in a very short life span. And, you know, it's, this, is, this, is, this is somebody who, you know, he, he died while I was in college. I was a sophomore in college when he died, was, you know, or going into my sophomore year. It was the summer of 75. So, you know, and- as I say in the book, I remember where I was. I remember the moment I heard uh, that that he had died, and uh, it was it, it, it felt personal. It felt like that. I'm sure for all of us, it did. Not just me. Um, I'm sure for a lot of people, we felt like we lost somebody we knew because he was always there. He was always in our home. He wasn't like, you know. It's one other thing he shares with Mark Twain. Almost no writer. Writers are pretty anonymous. They exist behind keyboards, whether it was typewriters in the old days or computer screens now, is writers tend to be fairly on the anonymous side. Um, and the best known writers in the world, that's still true. They are not universally recognized the way actors are. To be universally recognized is to be a true 14 karat celebrity. And one of the two of the only writers ever to pull that off are Mark Twain and Rod Serling. In their lifetimes, they were the best known writers on the planet, and there was no close second choice. You know, Mark Twain, somebody once said a letter to Mark Twain, which was simply addressed Mark Twain somewhere in the world. It got to him, it was delivered. <laughs> That's and, funny. And Rod Serling, because of television, because he was on television. 
Yeah. He was a writer that everybody knew. I mean, you know, at a time when, when, when most people could not have picked Saul Bellow or Norman Mailer out of a police lineup, they knew what Rod Serling looked like. And they knew what he sounded like. And they knew, you know, they could give you an immediate impression of him, which is really retaining full celebrity status. And that is also another very tricky thing to pull off. And I think, you know, that's another thing which, which again, he shares with, with, with Mark Twain. And you know, if Anne were still here, she would she would tell you this. He enjoyed it. You know, a lot of writers like being anonymous. They like the fact that you know, let the books speak for themselves, let the stories speak for themselves. Rod liked being recognized. Rod, there was a there was a bit of a ham in Rod, who liked to perform and liked to be you know in front of the camera. He might he, he might have denied it. He might have said, no, no, I. I did it because nobody else would or we couldn't find anybody else, but he liked it, you know, he, and, and so did Mark Twain. Mark Twain loved being recognized. You know, there's a reason Mark Twain dressed all in white at the end of his life. It, it drew attention to him, you know, made him the most conspicuous person when he went out for a walk or went, walked into a hotel lobby. And, you know, I think Rod liked that too. I think he liked going into a restaurant and people, you know, coming over and asking for his autograph and, he might protest, but I think he doth protest too much. <laughs> now, was that his idea on the second season to be in front of the camera? Um, you know, I, I think it was just a matter of, uh, you know, in the early seasons of the Dick Van Dyke show, you didn't, uh, Carl Reiner played Alan Brady, uh, Rob Petrie's boss, and the original conceit was that you never saw him. You, or whether you did see him, you never saw him full. They would shoot him from the back. They would shoot him in, in, pro, in profile, but you never saw what Alan Brady looked like, you know? And they, they, they pull it, and it finally just got to be, you know, why don't we have him turn around? You know, why are we keeping this guy in shadow? What's the reason for this? And originally the, the thought on the Twilight Zone was that he would be the narrator, that he would be, but if you remember if, if, and this is, you can only know this if you have like the collector's edition of the Twilight Zone, which are wonderful, the, the, the ones that Image put out many years ago. They have the original commercials and promos. Guess who did the promos during the first season of the Twilight Zone? Rod Serling. And the announcer would say, after the episode was over, um, Mr. Serling will be back to tell you about next week's episode. And then there would be Rod on maybe the set of the next week's episode and he'd say, you know, next week a, com a, com a, a compelling episode by, by Mr. Richard Matheson, something truly special, don't miss it. And then they would roll the credits. So Rod actually was on camera in the first season. If you were watching those shows on CBS in the first season, you were watching. Then I think that the feeling became, why don't we incorporate those into the actual narrations instead of just making them voiceover? And it just was like, why didn't we do that all along? It was basically Alan Brady. Why don't we just, why don't we just have him turn around? Um, and if you remember, the first season ends with um, an episode called uh, A World of His Own, which Richard Matheson wrote. And it starred Keenan Wynn as a writer who could uh, talk into existence. He could yes. dictate and, he, and whatever he talked into the dictaphone would come to life. And it was a power. Hat. And at the end, as a gag, because they really didn't know whether, you know, they were going to get another season or not. They had Rod come on and Rod said, well, I hope you enjoyed it, but this was a perfectly ridiculous thing. And Keenan Wynn says, Rod, you shouldn't say things. And he takes out an envelope that says Rod, certainly throws in the fire and Rod disappears. Yes. And he says, well, that's the way it goes in the twilight zone. And it was a final gag, but Rod can't come on camera at the end. So it was almost perfect then for him to be on camera for the opening narration of the second season. It was like an op a perfect continuation. So did they actually think that out and plan that out? Probably not. No, it just probably was fortuitous. It, it did work out that way. For the most part, the show is a half hour show, but there was one season where it became an hour long series. Did, was Rod happy with that? Um, I'm not sure Rod was happy with almost anything at that point. That's the fourth season. The th first three seasons, you know, the quality of the Twilight Zone is very strong in those three seasons. The first three seasons, I think, were when everything was hitting on all cylinders. 
the writer's room and the production offices were all very, very tight together. And, you know, everything was on, you know, uh, was on all cylinder. And then Rod took a break and they were off the air for, for half a season. That, 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 it, the fourth season would not only jump to an hour, it also didn't start until mid season. So there was just a feeling like something was off and something was off. He had gone back. He, that's was where he took some, some time off to teach. I think he felt like he needed to recharge his batteries. And then, you know, then those episodes were also an hour. And it's not to say that some of those hours are not really, really good because the miniature with Robert Duvall is in those hours. Um, on Thursday, we leave for home with James Whitmore is in those hours. So you got really outstanding episodes. But I think the feeling was that TV shows tend to find their, like water, tends to find their natural level. And I think the lesson was that The Twilight Zone was innately a half hour show. So for the fifth season, they went back to a half hour. They learned a lesson from the fourth episode, which from the fourth season. And that, that, that I think was that the hour was just not their, their ideal running time. It was just a little bit too much to get in and tell the story and get out. So the fifth season, and then the fifth season starts very strong. The fifth season in praise of Pip, Steel, uh, you know, Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, all of those are in the beginning of the fifth season. That's a very strong start. It ends poor. The fifth season, they're out of gas. By the, they're, well, you talk about sucking wind. You get to the end of the fifth season, some of the worst uh, episodes they did are in the last half of the fifth season. And uh, Was it Rod's idea to pull the plug? Um, I think everybody, I think it was everybody's idea to pull the plug. I think it's, you know, that it was just, I think there, there was just this, this rationale, it was over, you know. Um, I, I think, you know, Rod clearly wanted to, and you know, the thing you have to understand about the Twilight Zone too, which is, you know, uh, I think I say this in the book, I'm not sure, but we tend to look at uh, genre uh, series through, today's lens, not the lens of then, of a three network universe. And in a three network universe, when there were only three choices, um, anything that had smack of science fiction or horror or fantasy of any kind, never made the top 20. You know, The Twilight Zone was not a top 20 show. It, this was not live and death for this. It was acclaimed. It was one of the most acclaimed shows of its time. It was quality. But it was not ever flirting with the top 10 as far as success goes. And that was true of all genre. What had to happen was the audience had to get split up enough by cable and other choices that what you needed to make the top 20 went way down in number and in, in, in total audience. So not until the X-Files did a genre show actually make the top 20 with any consistency. Nothing. Star Trek didn't, you know, and all the shows that people think, oh, these, these were big hits. They weren't big hits. They, you know, they're, you, the big hits of the 1960s were shows like Gunsmoke and Bonanza. Now, those were shows which regularly made not only the top 10, but the top five, you know, and did it year after year after year. So, you know, it's not like the Twilight Zone was live, live and die by. It had a five year run, which was a very good for its time. 156 episodes, you know. I think it was just a, a feeling like, okay, it, it, this is it. This is it. And in truth, I think they were running out of stories. They were repeating themselves. There were, there, there, there are a lot of episodes in that fifth season that seem awfully familiar. Like, haven't we, haven't we met before? Uh, you know, there's, there's a second story about a ventriloquist with a dummy that can talk. Wait a minute here. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, a second episode, you know, about a couple who wakes up in a, a, a strange play, can't remember what happened the night before, and you're like, it sounds like a couple other episodes I've seen before. Um, so I, I think they were a little bit uh, uh, just just running out of gas, you know, and, and, and you know, they were also missing Ch uh, Chuck Beaumont because Chuck Beaumont was starting to uh, go down in health. You know, and, and he was using ghostwriters and just to, to keep things going. But, you know, Chuck Beaumont doesn't have a lot left at this point. And that's one of the major contributors there. 
So, you know, I think it all just kind of, it needed to end when it ended, you know. Networks can learn a lot from that because now if the show's not in the top 10, they would cancel it after three weeks. Oh, forget it. I mean, there's like you said before, there was only three networks back then. We have so many more options now. But Seinfeld's another example. That show bombed for the first two or three years because it was on Tuesday going against Home Improvement. Then they finally put it on Thursday after Cheers, and that's when it started to become more and more popular. But now well, they would probably yeah, cancel fine. the show. Go ahead, Rich. No, I'm saying now they would cancel a show like Twilight Zone or Seinfeld without giving it, oh, it's not really popular. It didn't kick in the top 10 for the first four weeks or five weeks, and we would have lost out on two great shows. Those are just two examples I could think of. Well, Seinfeld is all due to one person. There's a man by the name of Brandon Tartikoff, who was the head of NBC uh, Entertainment at the time. And what you, he liked, I mean, he got behind it. And... Uh, it wasn't just that it was in a bad time period. It's Seinfeld was so different than anything that had been ever been on before that it took a while for the audience to catch up to it. When something is different, if it's something is immediately accessible, you're looking at it and go, I, I know this, I know these characters. It's probably not that deep because you have seen it before. But when something comes on and it's really different, um, it generally needs at least a, one season for the, for the audience to catch up to it and go, oh, oh, this is, I get it now. I get it now. So um, the first time they put Seinfeld on, the audience didn't know what they were watching. It was, uh, it was not just that it had a bad time period. You know, and I even tried this out on uh, when I was, used to go out to California. Uh, the, once I, uh, this was in the, the late 90s. I went up to every president of every network entertainment department one year just to, because I wanted to prove what short memories they all have and nobody ever learns anything. And I said to them all, did you know, did you know that Seinfeld was not the original title of Seinfeld? And not one of them knew it. Seinfeld Chronicles. That's right. Now, th this is their business. <laughs> this is their thing. And, and we're talking about the most financially successful show in the history of the medium. I mean, Seinfeld is still building, uh, you know, mansions in Malibu. Seinfeld is still, I mean, it, it, any way you could make money, Seinfeld made money. You know, it made it in syndication, it made it in cable sales, it made it in foreign sales, it made it in licensing. Any way you could make money, Seinfeld made it and it's still making money. Uh, and it had to fail two or three times before. It was because Brandon Tartikoff just kept throwing it back on the air. And then finally it did find, but then the audience caught up with it. And a lot of the best television, what we think of today as really landmark television, generally became a hit in the second season. If you look back, you see the first season was not only about them finding themselves, about how, how you do it. You've got to find it on your feet in television but also the audience at the same time finding you. So, you know, All in the Family becomes a hit in the second season. Uh, you know, almost everything that was, was different. It, everything it be, that Norman Lear did. Yeah, well, All in the Lair, Family, uh, Maud. Almost all of them became second season hits. And the first season was all about them finding themselves and then everybody else finding them. And that was the X-Files. The X-Files started on Friday nights. And for the first, the only people who were watching it were the hardcore fans like me. And then in the second season, they moved it to Sunday nights. And they, all of a sudden, it was on magazine covers. And people were, oh, the X-Files. Oh, you're not going to be watching this. Began. But it was a second season hit. And um, that's, so you got to get to a second season. And, you know, increasingly in the history of the medium, uh, network executives got itchier trigger fingers. You know, in the days of the Twilight Zone, they might look at the ratings and say, yeah, they're not what we want, but let's roll the dice and give it another season. And back then they were doing like 36, 39 episodes a year. So this was a much bigger commitment. It's not just, and also the sponsor had a lot more to say in it. There was a point for about five minutes in the 60s when the Dick Van Dyke show was canceled. And Ro uh, Carl Reiner went to the sponsor and 
the, the sponsor said, we love being associated with this show. This is a quality show. So they went back to the network and said, we'll pay for it. We're the sponsors. We're paying for it. Put it back on the air. And they had the power to basically, you know, uh, get the Dick Van Dyke show back on the air for another season and become one of the great classic shows of all time. Oh, so, I, you know, th this, know yeah, this was all, you know, it was a different time is what I'm saying. It was a much, much different time. And then television just became too expensive, you know, for one sponsor to do, you know, back then they would always say, you know, here's you know, the Beverly Hillbillies brought to you this week by your good folks at Kellogg's, you know, and they would pay for the week. They would pay for the week. And then, you know, maybe they would have alternating sponsors, uh, you know, like Winston cigarettes would, would be the next week. And then they'd go back to Kellogg's the next week. Um, same thing with, with, with most shows. They, they had sponsors brought to you by those words have disappeared because the television's become way too expensive for one company to, to be the sponsor on it. So. Well, I remember listening to an interview with Lucy Arnaz, Lucille Ball's daughter, and she was saying that every time they would smoke on the show, they would get paid from the sponsor saying, yeah, you're promoting our cigarettes. And so, the, yeah, the sponsors had a lot more power back then. Yeah, and, and well, I mean, and that's a radio model. That's a model that goes back to radio. Almost all of the big radio shows, sometimes they were known as the, you know, the craft music hall. Well, where did that come from? Oh, because craft was... <laughs> So this was the sponsor, you know, Bob Hope show was known as the Pepsodent hour because, you know, <laughs> yeah. Pepsodent, you know, and, and, and WC Fields, the show is called the Chase and Sanborn hour. So, you know, some people might refer to those shows as, you know, Jack Benny or Burns and Allen, but they all had sponsors. They all had, you know, uh, they were, they were known as, and, and the soaps became known as soaps because they were, their sponsors were all, you know, people who made products for for housewives you know dishwashing liquids and things like that they were soap uh, you know, operas because they the sponsors were were selling soap you know so you know it, it, again it was a different time it was a much much different time you know? i think i will just be the last part we talk about with tv today because i want to get back to the twilight zone but i think unfortunately they realized that quote unquote reality shows which are nothing of reality at all are so cheap to make and they could just put a camera in there and not really have you know writer or, you know have writers on the set and it's cheaper and it makes money unfortunately for me i'm saying unfortunately because i just think it's the decline of television i love the classic television like we just talked about twilight zone i love lucy honeymooners i mean i can go on and on that's my favorite era of television and i'm only 52 so i mean well, i have, i wasn't even born the during then but that's my favorite era of television <laughs> Re reality shows are really in it were an accident um uh, what happened was this is that um reality shows have always been with us there were reality shows in the 1950s we had shows like queen for a day and things like this which today we might call reality shows they've always been kind of there but as a phenomenon they they come in around 2000 right with the new century and the reason was this in 1988, there was a crippling writer strike, which shut the town down. I covered it for Knight Ritter. I was out in Los Angeles almost that entire summer covering the writer strike. And it really shut the entire town down. You know, if writers don't write, directors can't direct, and actors can't, can't, can't act. Nobody does anything without the writer. And the Writers Guild has always been the most militant guild uh, in Hollywood. So there was a, in 1988, uh, in the towards the beginning of the summer, there was a massive strike, and it lasted for months. It lasted for several months, and uh, the impact was devastating. The rolling thunder of that, I mean, you know, it shut down the craft services, it shut down limo drivers, it, the costumers, makeup. Nobody was working. There was no work to be had. The town was shut down because of this. And it took a long time. Uh, and then, you know, it was finally settled almost um, at the point that the season was going to begin. It delayed the beginning of the season because it was, it was settled in, around September. But um, 12 years later, 
there was another threat of another strike by the Writers Guild. And the networks basically said, we're not going to get caught short this time. So we're going to have a plan B. We're going to invest in a whole bunch of writer proof programming. And this is where Survivor and Big Brother and uh, Who Wants to Marry a Millionaire? The, all these shows were ordered during this period. And the whole idea was when the writers go on strike, we'll have original programming to put on and it'll give us a wedge. Well, guess what happened? No strike. The, 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 the writers didn't go out, the issues were settled and the, the networks were left with all of this programming. So they said, they didn't have any faith in it. They didn't like it any more than you did. And if you remember, almost all that programming appeared when in the summer of 2000. Reason was they were burning it off. They just said, we'll just burn it off in the summer, you know, and it'll be, you know, stuff we don't, we've already paid for it. We, we only paid a ham sandwich for it anyway. So <laughs> but we just burn it off. And what happened? Survivor becomes a summer hit. The Big Brother becomes a summer hit. The following summer, American Idol becomes a summer hit. <clears throat> and they realize this stuff's like crack cocaine. You know, it's, it's, it's this instant buzz of, of big ratings. The problem with reality programming is not only, you know, does it lead to the degradation of quality that you're referring to. Yeah. The other is, is it's bad business. Reality programming is bad business because shows, Hollywood makes its money the way Seinfeld made money. It makes money on what's called the back end. Your own, the television makes its up, upfront money on two airings. The, the, the studios make it. So, so Warner Brothers makes Seinfeld and then NBC licenses it. And the first airing pays for Warner Brothers. The first airing is basically all the money goes to Warner Brothers uh, for making it. So Warner Brothers makes its money off the, the first airing. The second airing, the rerun, the, net, the network makes all the money. So it's in a big pile of upfront money off the first two airings that the network has licensed for. And that's your, that's your upfront. What's the back end? The back end is all the other ways you're gonna make money off a TV show. So that's gonna be reruns, syndication, cable sales, foreign sales, licensing, products. All of this is back end. How good is your back end? That's where the real money gets made. The problem with reality television is it doesn't even have a second airing. There is no back end. It's, it's, it's dirt cheap to make it, but you only get one shot at making any money off of it. And that's on the initial airing. So it's bad business. It's a bad business model. And, and, and yet it's addictive. It's like cocaine. It's addictive because you're not paying any money on it. There's no gamble. If it fails, who cares? Because you didn't spend any money. Because, and the most expensive type of programming is an hour drama. And that's, you know, th those are very expensive. You have big salaries for actors, you have scripts, you have location shooting, you have all the things which drive up the cost of that. The, the per episode cost on an hour drama is staggering. The cost of an hour of reality television is nothing. So it, it's, it's not just bad, you know, television, it's bad business. And it's been, but it's, you know, like I said, it's, it, it, it is, it has been the beast that has taken over, you know, and. Unfortunately, and I really don't see any end to it anytime soon. We'll see. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, At but again, you know, it's, it, it does come from, and, and again, it was a mistake. It was an accident. It, you know, this all happened because they were burning off the, what they, the, the inventory that they had, had put together as a hedge against a writer's strike. Talk about some classic TV. I want to get back to uh, your book in the Twilight Zone because I mentioned Nick of Time. That was one great episode. And I said like similar message in Nightmare 20,000 Feet in a World of Difference. Another message that he has in the classic episode, Eye of the Beholder. It's such a great episode. We all know the, the woman who played in Beverly Hillbillies. Was it Elena Douglas? I think her name is. Lana Douglas. Alana, yeah. Lana Douglas. Lana Douglas. Yep. And the lesson is conformity is the enemy. 
Oh yeah. Such, such a great message to anybody. Um, yourself. I, I, you know, and, and that's kind of special too, because Donna Douglas was the very first interview I ever did for the, for, for any Twilight Zone. But way before I was, when I thought I was going to be, um, you have time for this? Do you want yeah, me to? Yeah, definitely. Okay, no, right. let's keep going. <laughs> all right. Um, you know, I thought um, my first book, my very first book um, <clears throat> was a slice of theater history. And I, you know, the very beginning of my re career following the newspaper trail, I was working for small newspapers in uh, uh, Southwest Virginia and Upper East Tennessee, that area. And um, I was sort of a one man uh, arts and entertainment staff. A lot of fun, a lot of fun. Um, so I was basically a film, theater, and TV critic all in one. And uh, so I, I, there was a, a, a legendary regional theater that I call the Barter Theater, which it had its roots in the Depression. And it was a very colorful place. And I decided to write a history of it. And uh, a lot of famous people got their start at the Barter. Gregory Peck, Patricia Neal, Ernie Borgnine, Ned Beatty. You know, all these, you know, this, this, the guy who started the barter could spot talent. And uh, so a lot of these famous people got their start at the barter and it was very colorful. And I, so, you know, I was there, it was on my beat and that became my first book. And as that book was getting ready to be published, people started naturally saying, well, what's your next book going to be? And I said, I know exactly what my next book's going to be. It's going to be the history of the Twilight Zone my favorite show of all time and why not me why shouldn't i be the person to write that book never really stopping to think the one logical thing i should have been saying to myself at that point which was maybe upper east tennessee isn't the best place to be writing a book about the twilight zone maybe that's not the best ground headquarters for this but you know youth and high spirits i thought you know and, and i was doing enough interviews to sort of fool myself that i was going to write this book and the first one was donna douglas came to town to film a commercial for rvs and i had heard that you know it got tipped off at the newspaper indeed i ran down to the filming site and there she was dressed as ellie may clampett from the beverly hillbillies and uh so i i interviewed her and of course, I asked her about the Twilight Zone and Eye of the Beholder and Rod Serling. And she was very gracious and very wonderful. I even have a picture of me talking to her. My hair is completely black and uh, no mustache. And I look about 12 years old. And uh, <clears throat> and then, you know, two of the people who had uh, gotten their start at the barter and I interviewed for that book were in classic episodes of the Twilight Zone, Claude Aikens and Fritz Weaver. You know, so cause they're both in in multiple episodes. So I kind of was doing enough to think, you know, yeah, I'm going to write this book. You know, the 1982, I walked into a bookstore and had an experience that a lot of writers who dream of writing books have, of seeing, there it is, Mark Scott Secrees, The Twilight Zone Companion, you know. And uh, I bought it. I took it home. I read it. And I couldn't even be pissed off about it because Mark had done such a really good job on that book. He, it was great. I was, it was the book that should have been written and he did a hundred times better job than I ever could have or would have done with that book. Um, I, I have to say, I'm not just saying this, but I bought that book years ago and these are my two favorite books on the Twilight Zone. I think they're completely different and they're, I like them for different reasons. Well, like and with, that, with his book, he goes through every single episode, synopsis, this and that, and that. Your book tells you all the life lessons. So I enjoy both of them for different reasons. I appreciate it. But I'll tell you, you know, the, le my, the lesson for me, you know, if you're sort of looking at the, the, the life lessons of what you learned from the Twilight Zone, the life lesson that this whole journey was to me, for me was um, you can think you're pretty hot stuff. You can think you're in charge. I'm the captain of my ship. I'm making the decisions. But when you get to a certain point, you look back and you kind of realize you were pushed in certain places. You were kind of pushed in different directions. And the universe had a lot more to do with this than you did um, when you were really honest about it. And um, so when I said, you know, 
was uh, I'm in charge. My next book's going to be about the Twilight Zone. Was I right? No, the universe stepped in and said somebody else. This is the book somebody else should write. And they're going to do a great job on it. But being a practical fellow, I immediately set my sights on another favorite TV show, which was Columbo. Yes, I love that show. And my goal was now to write as good a book on Columbo as Mark had done on The Twilight Zone. You know, I've, I've subsequently told Mark this, is to say, you know, it, 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 that became my, my, the bar to meet and, 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 and at least get as high as what he had done. And the next year, I got a job as the TV critic at the Akron Beacon Journal. My job was now to be a TV critic full time. And now I was in the ideal place to write a book, a history of, of a TV series. You know, fate in the universe put me in exactly the right place I needed to be. And for the next five years, I interviewed and researched. And 1989, that book was published as The Columbo File. And now at that point, if you had said, what's your next book going to be, Mark? I said, once again, with full confidence, I know exactly what my next book is going to be, Rich. I'll tell you right now, you can put money down on this. Because, you know, Columbo was pub the Columbo file was published by the Mysterious Press, which was owned by Warner Books. And uh, so I now have this book out on, on Columbo. I've got a pretty good profile as far as you know, entree into the mystery side of things. So I'm going to write a book on Dashiell Hammett. And I, matter of fact, I take the proposal to the mysterious press. They like the idea. We shake hands. This is going to be my option book. So at this point, you ask me, what's my, what's your next book going to be? I'm telling you, I know what my next book's going to be. It's going to be on Dashiell Hammett. That book does not exist. That book does not exist because the universe stepped in and said, in the form of Warner Books, the Mysterious Press is no longer a nonfiction press. It is strictly a fiction press. And all nonfiction projects need to be cut loose. So I had a deal stitched up and all the stitchings came loose. And it was at that point that I thought, well, I'll find another publisher for it. And it was at that point that the phone rang and a small publisher in New York called and said, I read your, your, your Columbo book. I just loved it. And I said, well, thank you. That makes two of us. And he said, well, I um, was wondering, how would you like to write a, a similar type of book about the Night Stalker? And I said, well, I love the Night Stalker. I just didn't know there, there was a publisher crazy enough to publish a book like that. He said, well, I'm crazy enough to publish it. So I spent the next couple of years doing that. That book was published in 91 as Night Stalking. That led me to writing the first original Kolshak horror novel at that point in 20 years in 94, which was Grave Secrets. That led to the revised edition of the Night Stalker book, The Night Stalker Companion, which led me to editing three volumes of Richard Matheson's works, which led me to doing a book on Dracula. And what was happening was, and I didn't know it at the time, nor did I realize it, I was making a big circle back to the Twilight Zone. And when my daughter turned 15, as I explained in the book, I shared the Twilight Zone with her. And we did a forced march through the entire run of the series, all 156 episodes in order. And after each episode, I was jokingly saying to her, let that be a lesson to you. And then finally the penny dropped. And I said, you idiot, this is your Twilight Zone book. So 30 years later, I got my Twilight Zone book. And it was a big circle, but I had to be wrong at every step for this circle to work. The universe had to decide it. And I had, it was there saying, no, my next book's going to be this, my next book, I was never right. I was never right about what the next book was going to be. And it all worked out perfectly. So, you know, and as I said, and when I finally did write my Twilight Zone book, it was taking a tack which was completely different from what Mark had done with the Twilight, with the Twilight Zone Companion. So um, I not only got my book, but it was a much better, that was the book I was meant to write. That was the Twilight Zone book I was, was meant to, when I, when I got there, it was the one I was meant to write. But, um, you know, I, uh, at one point, um, got to interview uh, Brian Dennehy. And uh, at a point in his career when he had it knocked, 
when um, he just died recently, uh, a couple months ago. But the point I interviewed him, he was appearing on Broadway in shows like Death of a Salesman and Long Day's Journey Tonight. He was doing, you know, really wonderful movies. And he was doing really acclaimed TV work, miniseries and TV movies. And he was jumping from movies to TV to Broadway. It was like the perfect actor's career. And I said to him, you know, uh, how do you plan that? How do you make the plan to make that work? And he started laughing. And I said, what's so funny? And he said, Mark, I'm an actor. You know, asking an actor what his plan is is like asking somebody falling down a flight of stairs what their plan is. <laughs> you just go with it, you know? I thought it was such a good answer. I thought it was such a smart answer. And I thought that's what my career has been. I've been falling down a flight of stairs. And, you know, I, I so, you know, there is something to it. There is something about, you know, following your passions and following the things you're, you know, because that is the common theme. Um, but it, it also is the point where it's, it was almost like around somewhere around 1990, I was saying, I'm going to be a mystery guy. I'm going to be writing about, and the universe went, don't forget who you are. You, you were a monster kid. You were a horror fan in the 1960s. You grew up watching Dark Shadows and The Twilight Zone and Hammer Horror films and old Universal films. That's who you are. No, this was just a step to get you to here. So, you know, I'm going to send Carl Kolschak in and he's going to rescue you. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. And not the first time in my life Carl Kolschak rescued me, by the way, because, uh, you know, which would be a subject for a whole other show if you ever want to just talk Night Stalker. <laughs> I'm definitely going to have you back because two of my favorite shows in this growing up, again, besides Twilight Zone, is Kolchak, Night Stalker, and Columbo. I... I remember when Netflix first came out, the only reason I got Netflix was because I couldn't find Columbo anywhere else. And it was on Netflix. I said, I'm going to buy Netflix so I could watch Columbo. I think Peter Falk did such an, and that's another show that had so many great guests, like the Twilight Zone, had great acting, great storytelling. And since we're talking about that, I have a question for you. Did uh, Peter Falk improv a lot or was it all scripted? Oh, no, Peter would improv. Yeah, yeah you could tell. Well, we, we, well number one, See, Peter was the last actor who should have started in a, in a TV series. Um, Peter was a man of the theater, um, and he believed in rehearsal, and a lot of rehearsal, and he believed in scripts, which were done in advance, and he believed in a lot of, a lot of takes before you got it right. That's all the theater. That's all the instincts which are great for the theater, but television doesn't operate that way. Television operates fast. You move, everything is done at speed. You write the scripts as you go, which Peter could never understand. <laughs> you know, you would never start a movie without a script. You'd never start a play without a script. How do you start a whole season of a TV show and have no scripts written? He would never understood that. Um, and he liked to, you know, as uh, uh, his good friend, Ben Gazzara, who directed two uh, of the original Columbo episodes, once said to me, Peter's just warming up on take 70. So, uh, you know, and, and, and Peter would, you know, he'd be in conspiracy. It's why actors love doing Columbo because Peter would, would, would tell them, just keep doing it till you got it right. And I, I, every other television, it was like one take, and then I'll get on to the next one, boom, you know, it was all done on the run. And Peter was, you know, driving the network executives nuts because, you know, his, uh, yeah, you know, Ben Ben Gazzara told a story about how uh, they were in conspiracy. Is that whenever a network executive was around, you know, they would just start talking to each other in a really loud voice that the executives could hear, and 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 almost destined to drive them over the wall. So like, well, you know, we're gonna keep doing it till we get it right. Isn't that right, Benny? That's right, Peter. We're gonna keep doing this till we get. It. <laughs> but it was kind of true. It was kind of is that, and so you know, Peter. There was a lot of things that came out of, just came out of Peter uh, over the years. There's a scene in um, one of the first episodes that they did called Death Lends a Hand with Robert Culp. And Robert Culp plays this high priced private detective. And he's in Columbo is talking to him and, and they have lunch brought in. And he says, you don't, you don't mind if I eat lunch while we talk? And Columbo says, no, no, go right ahead. So he starts to eat. And during the scene, Peter leaned over and his tie fell into the food. <laughs> And Culp, without missing a beat, just kept the scene going, picked up the tie, wiped it off, and handed it back to Peter, and they just kept talking. 
And that's pure Peter. He encouraged them, the other actors, to do that as well. Um, yeah. There were lines that came out of the, the, the line, um, it's uh, where Peter goes up to, uh, it, it was a character, uh, the old character, actor, Dean Jagger, who plays a lawyer. And Columbo goes up to him, like, he's going to ask him something really important. And it, this was ad libbed, and Jagger went with him. He, he said, "He said, do you mind me asking you something?" And 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 Jagger said, "No, no, no, go." go he said, you, "You sure you don't mind?" He said, he said, no. he said, "How much did you pay for those shoes?" <laughs> I'm looking for a pair of shoes like that. That 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 you know. And, and, and he said, "Well, oh, you know, I paid like you know, like uh, 125 bucks for it. Do you know where I can get the same kind of shoes for like 17 dollars? You know." <laughs> well this just came out of peter you know this just That's funny this this just came out of so you know yeah he would ad lib he would um and they would find things you know during the the kind of the very many takes and the rehearsals and he encouraged that you know but what, the, you, you brought up one of my favorite things about Columbo is every time he's about to leave and say oh, i'm sorry to bother you i'm sorry to bother you my wife would kill me if i didn't ask you but where did you get that like it's just he would always now that you're saying this, I can almost see that a lot of that was improv. Like he was just thinking of something and it would come, I'm sorry to Bobby. Oh, well, actually, it's... do you know where that comes from? Do you know where the one more thing comes from? Is, this is the character Columbo has its, its, its origins in, in a short story that Levinson and Lincoln had written, or Dick Levinson and Bill Lincoln had written a short story called May I Come In. And it's basically the plot of the first story, Prescription Murder. Uh, it ends with a knock on the door and the murderer goes to the door, opens the door, and there's a policeman standing there. If the policeman had actually come in, it would have been Columbo, but he doesn't come in. So then they did a uh, episode of the Chevy Mystery Theater, which was a summer show. And this time they called it Enough Rope, and the character Columbo was actually in. It was played by Bert Fried, who was a bulky character actor. And he, he never even remembered playing it. Uh, years later, people said, you were the first actor to play Columbo. He said, I was? You know, he didn't know. But then they turned it into a play. I called Prescription Murder, and it went out on tour. And Thomas Mitchell, who played Uncle Billy in uh, It's a Wonderful Life, played Columbo. And this is why people are always astonished that Bing Crosby was was going to be considered for the role at first. And but you have to understand that Thomas Mitchell was an older Irish-faced actor, and that's why they were thinking about Bing Crosby at the time. Peter's was conception of it was what was completely different. They had to talk themselves into thinking of it like Peter playing it, not the other way around. But when they were typing this, the play version, they had written a scene between Columbo and the murderer. And they looked at each other and said, we forgot to have him ask about a certain thing and it's key. But they were too lazy to retype the whole scene. <laughs> so they said, let's just have him go back. <laughs> <laughs> and say, oh, just one more thing. And it was, a cool, it, well, it became the trademark. It was That's the hilarious. Thing, it became the trademark. But again, it was a, it was a happy accident is that they were just too lazy to retype the scene. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so, How many years was that show on TV? Well, 10 years. If, if you go from Prescription Murder, which was the first movie, there were two, there were two movies, uh, Prescription Murder in 68, and then um, Ransom for a Dead Man with Lee Grant. And then in the uh, fall of 1971, it became, they created the mystery movie wheel. And, and they did, because you couldn't repeat Columbo every, every week. First off, it was 90 minutes. And secondly, so they were making movie length stuff. And secondly, it was too rich a brew to repeat every single week. So the whole idea was to create the mystery movie so you could do Columbo six or seven 90 minute movies a year. And Peter would do that. And then you could keep the quality up as well. And the mystery movie went to 78. So between Prescription Murder and uh, The Conspirators in 78, that's 45 mysteries in 10 years. And then they brought it back in 1990 and did 24 more episodes on ABC. So that was the total. And I'll tell you, you know, uh, very, very quickly, and I'll be, this, this is not really a shameless plug, but I guess it is. Um, last year, uh, my book on the Columbo a series was published in 1989 and it was a steady seller for 10 years and then went out of print so it from 1989 to 1999 it was a very steady seller barnes and noble and and borders both kept it in stock and then it went out of print with a bang the book was never remaindered they just turned around 
Warner Books turned around to, to get another copy out of the warehouse and realized they had sold them all. So when the book went out, there was no warning. And that book started to raise in price online. You wanted a copy of the Columbo file. At first, you know, it was $50, $60. After a while, people were paying three, $400 for it. It was, it was getting just nuts. So last year, a uh, publisher, Commonwealth Books, called me and said, uh, how'd you like to have the Columbo file back in print? How many Columbo fans are left? How many, how many fans could possibly want that book? Um, I said, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a 30-year-old book, and I certainly don't have the time to update it. And they said, we'll do a facsimile reprint on it. And I said, yeah, I don't know. Well, they called me back, you know, because they called me. They were very insistent, and they talked me into it. I, I was basically... So I said, okay, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll let you do it under one condition. I don't have to raise a finger to help you. You know, I'll give you my permission. I own the rights to the book. You can reprint it. You know, but then me being me, I started to think about it. I said, well, you know, it needs a new, a new, a new preface. It needs a new, you know, it needs something to sort of, sort of I'll write you a new preface. Said, oh, that's good. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that. And I called him back and said, you know, I did a, a piece when Peter died, a memory of Peter, a memoir of Peter. I said, you know, I could flesh that out. We could put that at the end of the book, make it a little more special. He said, oh yeah, that's a good idea. We'll do that. And then a couple of weeks later, I called him and said, you know, there were 24 new mysteries. They ought to be acknowledged in some way. Let's put an appendix at the back of the book, which sort of is an overview of what happened after the book was published. And they said, okay, yeah, that, that sounds good. Well, after a while, I'd written 10,000 new words. And they called me up and said, you have got to stop. <laughs> you have got to, you didn't want to lift a finger. You didn't want to do this. You didn't even want the book to be done. And now you keep sending us new material. If you send us one more word, you're going to drive the, the page count over. And you're going to drive the cover price up. You've got to stop. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll stop. So the book was published November, late November of about a year ago. The next day, it was number one in Amazon in books and movies and television. It has been a steady seller ever since. I thought it might sell a few hundred copies. It has sold a few thousand copies. I am stunned, stunned at how many Columbo fans are still out there. I am just stunned that this character still has this resonance. It has far exceeded what the publisher thought it was going to do. It has far exceeded what I thought it was going to do. It is now reaching numbers that a major publisher would have probably tackled if they knew that there were this many sales in it. And uh, they put a, you know, a lovely uh, new cover on it. And uh, so, and it's, 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 it's available on Amazon. It's available around the world. And um, people, I keep, I keep, I hear from people in Australia, Germany, England, uh, Korea, people who have, you know, bought the book off of Amazon. And uh, it's just been amazing. I'm just, I cannot believe that the, the adorable appeal of this character. So I can uh, see why. I didn't think so either. I didn't think he was that popular still. I'm so glad that he is. Because growing up in that time, it was, there was Breda, you know, uh, Rockford, Jim Rockford, uh, Policewoman, Angie Dickinson. And then Columbo was always my favorite. There was just something about him. He was so likable, so relatable. And he was just this everyday guy saying, oh, you know, well, I got it. You know, I mean, I love the fact you see what happens in the beginning and just watching him go through the whole episode, clue after clue after clue, and coming to the end saying, All right, I know you did it. It's, it's, and it was the same episode, I mean, the same type of, same format every episode, but it never got yeah. boring. It's Had called so an open great guest stars. It's called an open mystery, Rich. The open mystery is where you know who the murderer is when before it starts and the question the mystery is not who did it the question is how is the detective going to catch it because you see the mission and this is very difficult because if you remember you not only know who the murderer is you see him do the crime in other words you've already seen how the detective is going to catch him it's already been played out <laughs> so the clue has to be so good you didn't see it and you don't detect it that is what it is an amazingly difficult form to write. Um, it is so difficult that um, when they were going to go to series and they knew they had to do six or seven of these a year, 
they uh, sent the word out to the Writers Guild and they said, we're going to screen the pilot for this new series called Columbo. We're going to screen the pilot and we're looking for prospective writers. Well, of course, every writer in Hollywood showed up. It was a packed house and they showed them the pilot, uh, Prescription Murder. Only two writers stayed. As soon as it was over, everybody ran out. I couldn't get out of there fast enough because there's no way I'm going to try to write this. This is, this is, are you out of your mind? And <laughs> one, of the, one of the writers who stayed was Jackson Gillis, who had written for Perry Mason and was the writer's credits. And he stayed. Um, but they, finding people who could write the open mystery was very tough. Very, because it is a, right. yeah. I remember once saying to Dick Levinson, who was a great guy, just a wonderful man. I remember saying to him, you know, that I said, it's, it's, it's a deceptively difficult form to write, isn't it? He said, there's nothing deceptive about it. It's just difficult, you know. <laughs> he said, it's an incredibly difficult form to write. And uh, so, yeah. He did it very well. The, the fact that Columbo kept up the quality as high as it did for as long as it did is really a testament to what a, a great show it was. So, you did know. Did you ever have a chance to meet Peter Falk? Oh, yeah. Uh, many times, many times. As a, I, I, you know, Peter gave his trust very slowly, very, very slowly. It, it took Peter a long time to arrive at a decision to do anything. So I knew when I set out to write the book that eventually I would have to, you know, interview Peter. How can you do a book about Columbo without talking to Columbo? And, um, the book actually started with an interview with, with Richard Levinson. He had done, he and Bill Link had done a, a, a movie for HBO called The Guardian with Martin Sheen and Lou Gossett Jr. in 1984. And I, they asked me, HBO said, is there anybody you want to interview? And I said, yeah, Dick Levinson. Um, I didn't ask for Martin Sheen or Lou Gossett. I asked for one of the, the writers. I think they were a little surprised, but I had an ulterior motive. Uh, you know, so I figured if I can put Dick Levinson in my hip pocket, I can ask him to sort of endorse my idea of doing this book on the Columbo series. So the interview went as well as I had hoped it would. And at the end of the interview, I said, to Dick, uh, you know, what would you think about me doing a book on the Columbo series? And Dick said, uh, I'd love to have a book like that to show my grandchildren what I did. And the irony is that Dick died just as I started writing the book. He died at 52 of a massive heart attack. He never got to see grandchildren. Um, but nobody contributed more to the book. Dick was, he, he opened doors. People who weren't doing interviews talked to me because Dick Levinson said, you need to talk to him. The first actor interview I did for that book was Leonard Nimoy uh, at the back of a ballroom at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. You know, I went up to him and, and he was very gracious and said, sure, I'd love to talk Columbo with you. So once I had Dick Levinson and Leonard Nimoy, I knew I was on my way. And then I just started collecting the Patrick McGowan. And every time I was out to go, I'd go out to Los Angeles twice a year on business. And every time I went out, I tried to get Peter to talk to me. And, you know, it was always a wall. It was always a wall. And meanwhile, I found out that he had been talking to Levinson and Link. And they kept saying, Peter, you need to talk to this guy. You need to talk to him. And uh, finally, uh, I think it was 1985, I was out there in January. And at the Century Plaza Hotel, and I got back to, this was before cell phones, you know, you, you either got your message of voice messages on the phone, you'd come back to the blinking light, or uh, you got the phone while it was ringing. And the phone was ringing as I was putting the key in the door, and I ran in, and it was Peter's assistant. And she said, Peter will talk to you now. Get in the cab and head to his house in Beverly Hills. He'll meet you in the driveway, his Garage has been converted into an art studio study. He'll talk to you there. I jumped in a cab and went to Peter's house, armed with all uh, tapes and a tape recorder. And, you know, and, uh, and I showed up and uh, we talked for hours. I filled hours of tape with, with, with it. And by the end of it, you know, I kind of knew, you know, uh, but I didn't have a publisher. I did not have a publisher. I was writing this book kind of on faith and on spec, which is how you're not supposed to write a book. And uh, Peter walked me out. I, was, I decided I, it was a really nice evening and I decided I'd walk back to the Century Plaza. So Peter walked me out to the end of the driveway 
And he said, well, let me ask you something. What makes you think people would want to read a book about Colombo? And I said, well, Peter, you know, to my mind, it's one of the great mystery characters of all time. It's one of the great series of all time. And I said, and you know, there's, there's probably now about 25 books devoted to Star Trek. Just Star Trek. So, you know, there ought to be at least one book on Columbo. And Peter sort of thought about that for a second, shook his head and said, yeah, you're right. There ought to be a book on Columbo. And I said, but you know, Peter, I don't have a publisher. I said, you know, uh, I, I think I'll find a publisher. And he said, don't worry, it'll happen. You know, and I always remember that because he showed, when Peter trusted, he just gave everything, you know. And after that, I mean, I, I tell a lot of these stories in, the, in the, the new material in the book. After the book was published, Peter sort of treated me as an unpaid uh, expert on Columbo. And he would call me at all hours of the night, never taking into account the three hour time difference between Los Angeles and, and, and Ohio. And he would call me in the middle of the night and he'd say, Mark, did we ever use a psychiatrist as the murderer? You know, <laughs> but, uh, but we saw each other quite a bit. Matter of fact, in the back of the book, I don't know if you can see this well. Yes, we can. Okay, well, I'll put that. Uh, I'll put this up. Just the. There you go. That's there, there's a picture that that was taken of me and Peter, I think in two thousand one. Yeah, December two thousand one. Okay, so you can read that well enough to to know that. So yeah, so that's uh that's my favorite picture of us together, and uh, yeah, and so uh, you know so and you couldn't know Peter without there being a lot of stories, and so I shared a lot of the stories in the book. Um, he was a character, you know. He was very much. He, he was a lot like the character in, in a lot of ways. He brought a lot of himself to that character. You know, the same tenacity that, Col that Columbo brought to being a detective, Peter brought to being an actor. You know, that same kind of relentless tenacity that Columbo had, that was Peter. Peter would wear you out. I mean, you know, Peter was, uh, I mean, like I said, he, he, he was brutal on, on, on scripts. He was, you know, always asking questions of, the scripts. He was always in, like I say, he was a nightmare to network executives. Just a nightmare, but, but, but a dream for other actors, you know. There's yeah. some actors that didn't get it. He didn't, I mean, in the course of that many years of working with that, I mean, he famously did not get along with Eddie Albert and Suzanne Plachette uh, when they were making Dead Weight. And he later apologized to Suzanne Plachette about it, that he admitted he was going through a rough period during that episode. But most of the guest stars really liked him. They really loved working with him. Glad the executive stuck with him. Well, the, Columbo was such a big hit. Columbo was an enormous hit. Columbo, without Columbo, the mystery wheel would have collapsed. It was the whole Sunday night franchise for NBC. And um, Univer and, and after a while, uh, there were cost overruns on Columbo because of the way Peter worked. Now, this had never happened before <laughs> in the history of television. And the guy who, who ran Universal Television at the time was a man by the name of Richard Irving. He actually had directed the first two Columbo mysteries. He actually had directed the first two movies. And then he had taken over the TV unit at Universal. So he was overseeing the production of Universal uh, as a series. And when Columbo started to have cost overruns, Universal basically went to the network and said, look, and Universal is one of the most bottom line budget conscious operations in, in Hollywood. Universal said, you know, we can't have this. Maybe we should cut the order and the number of episodes we're delivering to you guys. And NBC went, no, oh, no, 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 this is, <laughs> we ain't going to do that. So NBC offered to pick up the overruns. Uh, Richard Irving thought this was a terrible idea. Richard Irving, now it didn't cost him any money. It did, NBC was paying for it. But Richard Irving said, this is, this is suicide. This is stupid. You are bowing to the whims of an actor. You, you're making a mistake. But as long as Columbo was, was really nailing down an entire evening for NBC, it was crucial to them. And it was a huge hit. I mean, Columbo was, was, was a massive hit, and it was a massive international hit. Columbo exported really well. It was a big hit in China, Japan, 
Romania, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Italy, Germany, <laughs> France. <laughs> All these countries, Colombo, to this day, is a big hit. You know, uh, Peter could go nowhere in the world without being recognized as Lieutenant Colombo. When he was shooting the movie, well, not a very good movie, he shot a movie called Vibes with Jeff Goldblum and Cindy Lauper. If you remember it, you're a better man than most. Um, it was a very forgettable movie, but it, a, a good deal of it was shot in um, South America. And they were shooting up in the distant hills of South America. And these native people emerged from these hovels shouting, Colombo, Colombo. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So he was internationally yeah. recognized wherever he went. Um, if you've ever seen the, the Vim Vendors film, uh, uh, Wings, oh, what's it called? Just blocking out on the title. That's terrible. I should, I just, just, Wings of Desire. Okay. And Peter plays sort of an angel type character in this movie. And they shot a lot of it on the streets in Germany. And he's just, he's, he's playing like, you know, this, this, this angel like character. But in the background, you can hear people yelling, Columbo, Columbo. <laughs> <laughs> if you watch the movie, you, you know, you could actually hear this. And they just left it in. They just left it in because it's, you know, well, maybe, maybe Peter Falk and Columbo are the angel. Who knows? So they left it in. Um, so, so, yeah. Some I mean, people, did he ever resent only being known for that? No. Yeah, this is one of the good. great things about Peter is that a lot of people who, well, first off, Peter did get to go off and do other kinds of things. He was not trapped by, by the, even though he was known as Columbo, that identification. Um, he got off, he did Broadway, he did Neil Simon plays. He was the original Prisoner of Second Avenue. He did a couple of Neil Simon movies, The Chief Detective and Murder by Death. He did the films with John Cassavetes uh, and, and Ben Gazzara and Gina Rollins. He got to do a lot of other different types of roles and acting. You know, he's in some some of the most beloved films. He's in Princess Bride. You know, he got to do The In Laws with Alan Arkin, which is one of the great American comedies. Love that movie. Uh, yeah. Yes. So I mean, so Peter got to do. He was not trapped by Columbo. Number one, but number two, uh, the identification. I mean, this made him his life wonderful, and he loved Columbo. He loved playing Columbo. And he loved the character, and he loved the fact that, you know, the world, the whole world loved it. And he once said to me, I, said, I asked him that very question once, and he said to me, you know, you have to be nuts to resent this kind of popularity and identification. The whole world knows and loves this character, and there's nothing wrong with Columbo. And he, I, you know, I once asked him, you know, because there were there were different raincoats. Like there's there is a raincoat in the Smithsonian, but it's not the raincoat. Yeah. <laughs> there were there were pro, there were there, there were there were different raincoats. There were you know like stand-in raincoats and things like that. There was a raincoat that got donated to Easter Seals one year, but it wasn't the raincoat uh, that he had bought on in New York on a rainy day and became Columbo's raincoat. And uh, I once asked him. I said, you know, where is the raincoat? And he said, you know, he said. Yeah. I keep it in a closet upstairs and I put a saucer of milk for it out every night. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so just a way of saying how much he loved, you know, glad. The character and the identification with it. I go to a lot of conventions and I'll give you one example. I've met Linda Blair several times and I can't stand. Oh, she's a honey. Her. Oh, Linda no, Blair. No, 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 no. She's yeah. great. But yeah. I'm just surprised she doesn't, cause she, she's, I love what she does with the animals and the dogs. But when she, didn't want to talk about The Exorcist, which I know she's probably sick of, but the point I'm bringing up, and I said, I'm yeah. not bad mouthing her, is that yeah. if you're only, if I was only known for one thing, I would embrace that with everything. I like Columbo. I, and yeah. Another example is I like horror movies. And um, did you ever hear of the movie Phantasm? Sure. Uh, yeah, Reggie Bannister. I met him, and he is just like Peter Falk in that respect. He knows that, you know, without the fans and without that character, people, he wouldn't be where he is now, and he embraces it a thousand percent. So, yeah. That I, maybe that was a bad example to bring up with you, but I was just I was no, surprised no, 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 to see no, 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 talking no, about the exorcist. Yeah, no, no, it's because it, it, it's it's I I'll just say I I I've, I've been gone to horror conventions and I've been on a next table with Linda Blair, oh, yeah, and right. uh, you know and 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 just and I've interviewed her a couple times, so you know I I just I think she's a, she's just a terrific person, but that doesn't mean 
you know, she doesn't resent. And and I've talked to other actors who've resented the identifications with with when the identifications become and I've, you know, who have resented it, who have felt trapped. And you know, I mean, to a certain extent, I understand it. It just wasn't Peter's view. Peter was delighted. He loved being recognized as Columbo. Yeah, I don't blame you know, him. And I'm glad of that because I love the character and, the, and as he said, the world loves the character. But if Peter had felt trapped by it, or it would have been understandable. You know, if he had gone the other way, you know, actors want to be known for their versatility. They don't want to be known just as, you know, one role or one, one part. And, and people have seen how roles can, can trap you. You know, how roles can, you know, identifications can trap you. You know, it's just, you know, Bela Lugosi never escaped Dracula. He never, you know, the Hollywood never saw him as an actor. They saw him as Dracula. And, you know, he did enough roles that they should, it should have demonstrated to them that he was more than a one role actor. You know, uh, his performance as Igor in Son of Frankenstein should have showed them this guy could do a lot of things. Um, but, you know, I've certainly known my share of actors who did resent uh, being identified, completely identified with one role or one genre and felt, felt constrained by it. But, you know, Peter could afford to, to do, like I said, because he did so many other things. He, yeah, he, he you know, uh, they, they did a documentary on Peter, uh, A&E, back when A&E used to do documentaries. And A&E stood for Arts and Entertainment. A&E did a documentary on Peter. I'm the first voice you hear in that documentary. Uh, and the thing I'm saying is that, you know, there's so much more to Peter than the raincoat. Uh, that you know is 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 you know he's not just a Columbo type of actor. He in fact first made his reputation playing gangsters, vicious gangsters. Most of his early roles, if he was going to get typecast early, it was going to be playing these vicious mobsters. But then Frank Capra gave him a chance to do comedy in uh, Pocket Full of Miracles, and then people thought of him as a guy who could also do comedy. So he's in films like The Great Race, and it's a mad, 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 mad world, and He's, you know, he's the kind of guy, but then he gets to do uh, really dramatic parts on, on, on TV shows like Ben Casey and The Untouchables. And uh, he gets to do movies. And by the time he gets to Columbo, he's kind of changed people's perception of him several times. And then he also becomes, like I said, he's, he, he's not just a Columbo kind of mystery actor. He's, he's a Neil Simon kind of actor. He's a John Cassavetes kind of actor. He's a, you know... Um, and he still gets back to go back and do comedies like, uh, like, like the in-laws. So he, he, he was, Peter could afford to be that, that magnanimous is what I'm saying, because he didn't get trapped by Columbo. Columbo opened up opportunities for him to go do me, other things. It reminds and, me of a past guest I had, Adrian Barbeau. When she first started out, she was Rizzo in the, the original Rizzo in Greece. So we thought of her as a singer, dancer. Then she did Maude. Oh, she's a comedian. Then she did a TV, another TV show. She could never be a movie actress. Then she became a movie actress. She said she was always typecast for a little while. Then she'd try something new. Then she'd be typecast in that, little, that role for a little bit. Then she'd try something new. So, yeah, very similar because she just was never constrained to that box that they tried to put her in. Like, yeah. oh, let me sing. Let me dance. Let me do comedy. Let me do drama. Yeah, and, and she worked with a director who did feel it, was Wes Craven. You know, I, I, I knew Wes fairly well because he was from Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And Wes always said, you know, he, he did horror because that's what he got a chance to do. If, if somebody had offered him a comedy at first, he would have done that. You know, I mean, if you've met Wes, he, he, he was this soft-spoken guy who reminded you of an English professor, which is what he was before he became a director. He was English and philosophy. And people met Wes and they expected they were going to meet this biker guy dressed in leather with piercings and tattoos and greasy hair. And then they meet this guy who reminds you of, you know, the most mild-mannered English professor you have ever met. And Wes did feel, I think, a bit trapped by the horror field because it's all they wanted. He tried to do another. He tried to do a film about music with Meryl Streep. And he once said that, you know, because his mother was a very strict Baptist woman. She was raised in a very strict Baptist household. And he said he wanted to make one movie his mother could go see. And that's quite a thing to say, isn't it? And uh, 
you know, and I and West started to blend more comedy in what he did towards the end when he did with the Scream films and things like that. But I do think he did feel, you know, like he'd been typecast. Like actors are typecast. He got typecast as a director. And it's an iffy proposition because of what we were talking about before with branding. Versatility does not help a lot of actors. You have to be De Niro to, or, or Meryl Streep for versatility to work for you. Everybody else, uh, branding helps. If you're a writer, you were marketed by what you do and you have an identification and we're almost suspicious of versatility. It's like, you know, why isn't Robert Wise considered the equal of Alfred Hitchcock? Well, Robert Wise did great horror he did The Haunting. Tell me a better horror movie than The Haunting. You know, he did great science fiction. He did The Day the Earth Stood Still, one of the great classic science fiction movies of all time. He did musicals. He did West Side Story and The Sound of Music, two of the greatest musicals in the history of musicals. He did biographies like Somebody Up There Likes Me. He did film noir. He did mystery. He did action adventure. He did historical dramas. Yeah. And people are almost suspicious of that. When you put all of Robert Wise's credits together, it's one of the most impressive resumes you've ever seen, but nobody thinks of him in the same category as Alfred Hitchcock or John Ford. And well, why not? Because, well, he bounced from genre to genre. And so we have a hard time getting our, our mind wrapped around Robert Wise. While, you know, it's easy to get your mind wrapped around Hitchcock. Oh, Hitchcock did thrillers. He did suspense show thrillers. It's easy. He was a specialist. We love specialists. You know, we love people who stick to one thing and become like, you just know, see, they, those are artists. You know, well, why isn't the, the other guy an artist? You know, just, exactly. I agree with you. I love versatility. And I guess an example for today's world would be Steven Spielberg. I mean, starts off with Jaws, then he does Lincoln, Schindler's List. He does so many different types of movies, even though he started off maybe doing horror than fantasy, like with E.T., but he's he's been very versatile. Jurassic Park, which you just said, there was like five different adjectives to describe that movie. So, um, and then for actors, I would say right now would be Christian Bale and Kate Blanchett. I could think of right off the bat. I'm sure there's plenty more of them missing, but yeah. those two, they can play so many different roles. And the, when I when I watch them, I don't see the actor; I see the character. Well, and and again, you know, with, with, with Spielberg, look at the level of success he had to attain before he forced the issue to, to be able to do Schindler's List and Saving Private Ryan and do the movies which people didn't think of as Spielberg movies. He had to become a big, big power player in order to have the power to make those movies. Um, and very few people, you know, attain that. No, matter of fact, almost nobody's ever attained the level of commercial success that Steven Spielberg has. So, I mean, you know, I, I mean, I've had this discussion with um, somebody who has a tangential uh, uh, association with the Twilight Zone. It's a writer by the name of uh, William F. Nolan. And Bill Nolan was part of a group of writers who was known as the group, um, they, they, or the California group sometimes. And these were writers who clustered around Ray Bradbury. And they all met at Ray's house. Ray was their acknowledged leader. And Ray was the one who had made it, was the best known. But the group included Richard Matheson, Charles Beaumont, Jerry Soule, Robert Block. You know, these were, the, the, these were guys who, you know, they, they basically were the fantasy horror writers of the moment. And Bill Nolan was right there with them. You know, now Bill Nolan with George Clayton Johnson, who was one of his best friends, uh, had wrote a uh, a story called Logan's Run, you know, so which had made into a movie and, and a TV series. Bill Nolan wrote scripts for Dan Curtis. There were some of the wrote uh, the the a good deal of the script for Trilogy of Terror, which yeah. were Richard Matheson stories. Yes, and Richard Matheson gets all the credit, but Bill Nolan had a big hand in that. And Bill Nolan and, and Richard Matheson were very very good friends too. But Bill Nolan is not as well known, should be, as the others. And to this day, Bill, Bill is still with us. Bill lives in the Pacific Northwest, is in his 90s. <clears throat> and Bill will tell you he thinks he should have stuck to one genre. Bill will say, I should have been like Stephen King. And I should have stuck to one thing. And I would have been better known and had a more successful career. 
But Bill is, have to be like that. What's that? It's, uh, it's unfortunately it's sad yeah, that yeah. people are that close minded that you can't jump out of your comfort zone and try something new and be successful in more than one genre. That's Cause, right. Because Stephen um, Stephen King actually is successful. I mean, look at Shawshank Redemption. Look at The Green Mile. That's not horror. And then when people say, "Oh, he's a horror novel," he's actually a great writer in different genres. Well, and indeed, this is a this is a very much a 20th century American conceit we're talking about. Yeah. Because, you know, before that, we didn't have these kind of specialty labels or this branding, this marketing of branding. You know, and, and Bill's argument is sort of a moot point because, you know, and, and having a resume that's similar to Bill's, you know, is that I, I, I have a very schizophrenic resume. Um, I once was at a book fair where, you know, they, they had a collection of my books on, on a table and somebody went by the table and they stopped. And they sort of looked and they had this puzzled look on their face. And they looked up at me and they said, said, what's wrong? And he said, well, I don't get it. I said, well, what's not to get? He said, well, what's the common theme here? There's, there's, there's books about Mark Twain. There's, there's books, uh, there's a literary biography. There's a book about Theodore Roosevelt. There's, then there's all this Dracula and horror stuff and the Twilight Zone. And it's like, what's the common theme? And I said, you're looking at it. Me, I'm the common theme. Yeah. These are all my my passions. These are all the things I'm interested in. These are reflections of, of the things I'm interested in. Uh, there doesn't need to be more of a common theme than that. And it's similar to my, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I was going to say it's similar to this show. Somebody asked me, what kind of guests do you have? I said, anybody who is interesting. Yeah. I don't, I'm not going to have only writers on, only actors. I'll have writers, directors, actors. Um, there's this kid who was on a holy moly tv show and he goes around um around the world reviewing mini golf courses just anybody that's interesting to me i'd love to talk to them i can go on forever so yeah i i love the fact that you have very eclectic taste and everything you're talking about i grew up loving and watching and you know i love Coltac, i love colombo twilight zone i'm a big mark twain fan dracula i love the bale lugosi movies christopher lee so just yeah. keep doing what you're doing this is coming from me. Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing it correct. Well, I mean, and, and again, I, I follow, I don't think it's any mistake that most of my, you know, the writers I, I most admire, not, not all, but most of them are uh, 19th century writers because that was an era when you didn't have to. Like if you had said to Edgar Allan Poe, he, oh, you know, you're a horror writer. He wouldn't have known what you were talking about. First off, they, did, they didn't have the term horror writer. So, you know, he was, oh, you mean I read, write gothics? Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> but even then, Poe, who only lived to be 40, we talked about Rod Serling living only to be living 50. Poe, who only lived to be 40, his collected works span 17 volumes. That much of it, maybe that much of it is horror. And the two things we know Poe for today are the terror tales and the yep. mystery stories. He's considered the father of the, 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 the detective story and the modern horror story. But it's a very small part of who Poe was as a writer. To understand his great achievement there, like with Surly, you have to understand everything else. And one of the things that he wrote a lot of was, guess what? Humor. Now, nobody thinks of Edgar Allan Poe comedy writer. Uh, you don't even think of him smiling, but he had a great sense of humor, like we were talking about Rod Serling. And he wrote a lot of humor. He wrote a lot of pieces which were satires and hoaxes. And the humor shows up in his horror stories and in his criticism and everything else and in stories about his everyday life. Like Rod Serling, he had a great sense of humor. Yeah. And we don't think of Poe that way. All we think of is the brand. We think of the guy with the big hollow eyes sitting up in the attic with a raven perched on his shoulder and a yeah. black cat at one hand and a bottle of cognac at the other, writing these stories out of some kind of drug-induced drunkenness, fever dreams. And that's not who Poe was. He was a very careful artist and a very careful craftsman. And he wrote horror because he was called to it, but he was called to write a lot of different things. And that's only a part of who he was. Yes, he was a genius at it, but he didn't define him. And no writer who wrote horror in the 1800s, Mary Shelley, Bram Stoker, Robert Louis Stevenson, they just wrote horror if it was the best way to tell a story. You know, if Stevenson one week was writing Treasure Island, an adventure story, 
The next week he was writing a child's garden of verses, poems about childhood. And the next week he was writing Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So it was just like, you know, well, that's where I am this week. That's where I'm writing this week. You know, I have a lot of arrows in, in the quiver. And why do I have to just limit myself to one? How boring. But that's what we do. That's what we do with, like I say, our directors and our, and our, and our, and our writers and, our, and, our, and we penalize them for, for the versatility that just was a natural thing to writers in the 1800s. So, uh, you know, I, I, that's why I say, you know, the Bill Nolan and the Robert Wises of the world should be more prized and better appreciated, you know, but they're not. <laughs> they're not and maybe we'll go back to it everything is is a pendulum everything everything goes you know swings one way and then swings as poe told us and fit in the pendulum you know it's, it, it does swing one way and swing the other so everything go everything is cyclical so it what, what was it popular is. one day it's going to come back again maybe 10 years from now just exactly. something, so i'm exactly. hoping that that's and i love the work that you're doing you know with poe rod serling colombo Kolchak keeping keeping it fresh in people's minds that may have never heard of any of these things. Well, and and you know we we never even talked about Mark Twain, but you know when we're, we're just we just we just kind of mentioned him in passing. But five of my books are on Mark Twain, you know. I and you were a Mark Twain expert or aficionado, and that's why I definitely want to have you on the show again because there's so many different topics we could talk about. You Mark know the Twain. sad the sad thing is now how little time it takes me to get into makeup and play Twain. <laughs> it used to take me when I first started playing Mark Twain. I was 22 years old when I did my first makeup for Mark Twain. It took me two hours to look like this. <laughs> and each year the makeup process got shorter and shorter. And what I did not know at 22 was that I was showing what myself what I was going to look like at 64. I had no idea that that's exactly what I was doing. That 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 makeup process in aging my face. I've got pictures of me, you know, looking in the makeup mirror at 22, and this is what I look like, you know, and uh, this is, I'll, leave, I'll leave you with one story, which is um, because um, I always, you know, and as I already have, I always give full credit to Hal Holbrook, because Hal showed the rest of us how to do it. Uh, without Hal, there'd be no Rosetta Stone, because there are no recordings of Mark Twain's voice. Uh, th th he made them, but they all went up in a warehouse fire. So we have no authenticated recordings of Mark Twain's voice, which is kind of remarkable because we have recordings of almost everybody around Mark Twain, Theodore Roosevelt, Booker T. Washington, William Jennings Bryan. We don't have Twain. So, you know, Hal put together his characterization of Twain in the 1950s when there were many people still alive who had known Twain including his daughter, Clara, his private secretary, Isabel Lyon, the son of his lecture manager, and they all helped him get the voice and the mannerisms just right. So, you know, I, I, I fully tell people, you know, I learned how to portray Mark Twain, but I went to school on, on Hal Holbrook, and I wouldn't step on stage without his blessing and his permission. Um, but about, oh, I don't know, it's got to be about 10 years ago, we had dinner at a steakhouse and I said to him you know you will always be the gold standard when it comes to portraying Mark Twain nobody will ever touch you nobody will ever equal what you have done it is one of the great accomplishments of the American theater it is one of the great accomplishments of Twain scholarship what you have done but there are now two ways I actually can beat you and he sort of raised one eyebrow at me and said, yeah, watch that. I said, well, number one, I now can get on stage faster than you can. <laughs> I said, it still takes you two hours in makeup to look like Mark Twain. But while you're still in makeup, I can be out there in no time flat. It's pretty much put on the white suit, grabbed a cigar and go, which is not actually technically true because I still do some makeup to return to get the eyebrows up and do some aging here and some things to accentuate the, the cheekbones and such, but it's not much compared to what it used to be. It's not much. It's not the full Lon Chaney transformation that I used to have to do to look like this. And he said, well, what's the other thing? Is there a way you could beat me? And I said, well, I'll do something you will never do. And I know that he, he would never do this because 
Hal needs to be in perfect control of everything that he does on stage that he says. And I do a show where I, where I offer, well, I'll do Q and A as Mark Twain, where I don't know what I'm gonna do. I will walk out in front of an audience in a white suit and say, well, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, you can ask me anything you want. Just uh, go ahead and hit me with your best. And then people can just ask me questions and I'll respond as Mark Twain. I know enough about Mark Twain's life and his writing and I've got enough committed to memory that I can like almost Twain jazz, improvise an answer, which is going to be 90% Mark Twain. The only stipulation is you can't ask me, you know, uh, what would Mark Twain think of Donald Trump, for instance. You know? uh, we don't know what Mark Twain would have thought of Donald Trump. We might imagine what he might have thought, but we don't know. So, you know, if you ask me about the president, I'm going to tell you about Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, you can only ask me things that, you know, are, are you know, of Twain's time and experience. And Hal just shook his head and said, you're right, I'll never do that. And I said, well, you know, in the range of your accomplishment, those are rather small, petty victories. But I'm a small, petty person, and I'll take them where I can get it. So, you know, that's, that's the, the only ways that I, that I know of that, I, that I've got any edge, because otherwise, like I said, he, nobody will ever touch him. Nobody will, he, he did about 18 hours of material as Mark Twain in an ever-changing, evolving show. And he did it at such an incredible high level. And whenever I think I'm getting pretty good, uh, I remember one of the performances I've seen him do, or I go back and I look at the 1967 CBS special and I go, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's the best thing I do as an actor. And it's not, it's not one tenth of what he could do as an actor. So I, I'm, I live in Connecticut. I live 20 minutes away from the Mark Twain house. I've been there many of times on the tour and it's so interesting. It's funny because I was on the tour maybe several years ago and I brought up the question about them taking words out of the book because oh, that's, that's not uh, politically correct anymore. I said, but that's how they talked back then and yeah. it shouldn't be censored. And the woman said, you know, out of all the tours I've done, you're the only one that actually brought that up. I said, really? It, I was the only one who brought that. But I think that's a huge thing that they want to take words from classic literature because it's not politically correct anymore. And I think that uh, I do not agree with that at all. And she, she said, yeah, I agree with you. She goes, it seems like most people don't even know or care about, like, she was talking about the younger people. And I said, well, they should care. Well, I, I tell you, you, and you'll relate to this as a performer, um, is that, uh, you know, when I do certain things, um, as a performer with the, with, with the theater company, my wife and I have, um, you know, it's new and, and, and I'm not as, as, as comfortable with it, but, you know, I, Twain is, 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 is I, I guess because I have got so much committed to memory and I've been doing it for so long um, that I'll switch it up. I mean, if I go out and I'm going to do like two hours of material and I detect the audience is really likes this sort of thing, I'll change my game plan midstream and say, okay, I'm going to go more down this road. And, you know, and almost every time the instinct is right. You, as you know, as a, as a comedian, you, you get very good at reading audiences. You get very good at sensing audiences. And, um, but Twain has become the most comfortable thing I do. That white suit is an extraordinarily comfortable outfit to wear. It fits very well and it fits very comfortably. And when I walk out on stage as Twain, it's, there's, I have, I, I cannot think of the last time I had anything close to what you would call nerves or stage fright or, or any, or butterflies or whatever you want to call it. Uh, in playing Mark Twain, I can't think of the, any time. There's one exception, one exception. And that's in 2000, I can't remember, I want to say 16, but I'm not positive. 2016, 2017, I was invited to play Mark Twain in the house at Hartford. And uh, Cindy Lovell was the uh, director at the time. And she brought me in. I've, I've play, I, play, I played Mark Twain at Quarry Farm where he spent his summers. I played Mark Twain at the Thurber House in Columbus. I played it at the Barger Theater, the, the theater I wrote a, uh, the history of. You know, I've, I've played it in many, many different states. But we got to 
Hartford that day. And we were going to do it at the visitor center, in the auditorium in the visitor center, that very nice modern stage. And when we got there, Cindy said, well, you know, there is one other way we can do this. And I said, yeah, what's that? She said, well, you could do actually perform this in the house, in the library where the family used to put on things. We'll set up chairs in there and you can do it in there. And when they revived me, I said, you know, I could have sworn you said I could perform in the house, you know? <laughs> and uh, that's where we, perf that, so the dressing rooms. Now, the first time I went to the Mark Twain, I grew up on Long Island. I grew up in Huntington, on Long Island. And the first time I went to the Mark Twain house, about 1973, 74, I, I was about 15 years old and falling under the spell of Mark Twain. And my parents drove up there and took me there. And at the time, the, there was no, that modern visitor center, that's, a, that's very new. The visitor center you, where you bought your tickets and where the gift shop was, was in what's now the coach house. And all the exhibits were in the basement of the house. They were in the, 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 the basement of the house had been transformed into exhibit space down there. And there were two restrooms down there. There was a men's room and a women's room down there. Well, that space had been completely deserted it was just it's just really used for storage space now but the bathrooms are still down there so they said you and you know i performed a show with my wife with sarah and the, they said you can use the bathrooms down there as your dressing rooms and when it's time there's a stairway that comes up and enters into the main hallway and then you can come into the the library through the side bedroom i have to admit um Performing as Mark Twain in that house got to me. Um, that was, there was a case of nerves that night. Getting, and getting dressed in that basement, in, in that, and then going up those stairs was just spooky. It was yeah. just, you know, and when, you know, I came out in that main hallway and worked my way around, I thought, wow, <laughs> this is a moment. Um, you know, and, and the show went very, very well. And good, I had just done a book on Twain, so we did a book signing afterwards. We went back over to the, the gift shop and then we did a book signing in there. And I, as we were walking over, Cindy said to me, you know, you're the only the third person that ever played Mark Twain in the house. Wow. I said, and one of the others was Hal Holbrook. I said, really? And she said, yeah, you know, we're very careful. We can't just let anybody come in here, you know, and you have somebody who comes in and portrays Mark Twain and they do something which violates the spirit of Mark Twain in the house. You know, that could be very problematic. I said, well, why'd you let me do it for? And she said, because of your standing as a Mark Twain scholar, you're not just a Mark Twain performer. The fact that you've actually, you know, published papers on Mark Twain and books about Mark Twain, we figured we were fairly safe with you. We figured you weren't going to do anything which was going to, you were going to stick very close to the spirit of Mark Twain. And I said, well, I'm glad you didn't tell me that before I went on. <laughs> you know, I was nervous enough before I went on. If you had told me that before I went on, I, I, might, have, I might have collapsed. No but pressure. No pressure. <laughs> but the Hartford House, that's the only time I ever felt it. Or that I, that I, in, in, in many, many years, it's the only time I've ever felt anything close to that. Those butterflies, those pre-show butterflies. You know, once I put on that suit, I'm, you know, I'm fairly confident in in how the show is going to go. So, and, I've, uh, and that's all due to Mark Twain. It goes back to what we were talking about before about how, you know, they'll always take it from Mark Twain and they won't take it from anybody else. So. Hopefully you have a you chance know. to come back to Hartford because I'd love to see you as Mark Twain. I have a standing offer. I have a standing offer to go back to Hartford. Um, uh, and, as a matter of fact, uh, they, they invited me. I'd done a book. Uh, I love this book. I love the way it came out called uh, Mark Twain for cat lovers. And Mark Twain did him. He adored cats. He had cats his entire life. And we have just so many great pictures of him with cats. So, you know, we have, we just had no shortage of, of, of just lovely, charming pictures of him with cats. And he had them from childhood up to his last days in Stormfield in Reading, Connecticut, where he died. Uh, so, you know, this is a collection of all, you know, his, his, his thoughts on cats, stories he'd made up for his daughters about cats, cats that appear in his stories and books. 
And um, Hartford did a, a whole uh, display at the visitor center on Mark Twain and dogs and cats. And they used this book in a book a friend of mine, Kent Rasmussen, had written on Mark Twain and dogs too, as the centerpiece. And they invited us both to come in. Neither one of us could make it. And uh, so, but there's kind of a standing offer to go back. I know them well. So I'm sure sooner or later I will get back there. And, you know, hopefully we'll be packing the white suit with me when I go. All right. Well, next time I will definitely be there in the front row yep. watching you as Mark Twain. Well, I, you know, again, you know, it's one of the things that about the pandemic I've missed. This is the first year I have not played Mark Twain since like 1979. <laughs> you know, so it, it really drives, you know, it, 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 there's always like at least several times a year that I'll climb into the white suit and do, do a show somewhere and this is the first time that that's been cut off and you know so i do miss it i do kind of miss the uh you know you do a, a one-man zoom show you know i wouldn't mind doing i i don't know that i would do what i normally do i would probably try to do something special because the problem with doing a zoom show is so much of it is the, the, the response of the audience it's like doing stand-up comedy in front of a zoom right camera, right Exactly. You, you, you're not being fed uh, the response of the audience. So much of, the, uh, of, co of comedy is reciprocal. Uh, and you've got to be able to feel what the audience is, 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 is getting. And that's tough. That is tough. I did, a, um, I did a, 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 a talk on Mark Twain. I do a talk on Mark Twain and Rod Serling called Moralists in Disguise. Basically talking about how they were both extraordinary moral writers who gradually disguise the messages mark twain with humor and rod with fantasy and um i did this i've done this talk for many years there's a lot of laugh lines in it and i did it for a library for zoom and you don't know whether they're laughing or not you don't know you know is it like, <laughs> you get to the, the legend like, well i think they're laughing i think this is you know this is going well but you know but it's also comedy is so much about how the audience feeds you back and the problem with zoom is no matter how good the connection is you don't know so i wouldn't mind working up like some specialty material on mark twain for for zoom presentations but i don't think i would do the type of show that i would that i've done you know uh that i usually do because i think that requires an audience i think it requires the audience and the audience response and we all going through it in a communal way together you know, it's, I mean, I, I can't imagine uh, doing stand-up comedy by Zoom. I just, you know, I did stand up, you know, I, I used to work with a partner. Uh, I did, I, I've, I've done my share in the comedy trenches. Okay. Uh, I've, I've had two comedy partners and, and comedy teams have all disappeared. There's nobody that has comedy teams anymore. Um, and that's largely, I think, because the function of comedy clubs became servicing a very young often drunken audience and in order for comedy teams to work comedy teams talk to each other they don't talk to the audience the stand-up comedians talk to the audience the comedy so in order for comedy teams to work the audience has to be interested enough to invest in the relationship between the two people on stage and that's become almost impossible in clubs um so, you know, in the last days when you could actually, and, and the majority of work I got, you know, my ex-comedy partner, the guy I worked with for five years in uh, Tennessee, Virginia, Kentucky, um, asked me what he's doing now. <laughs> what is he doing now? <laughs> His name is David Browning, and David is the official Barney Fife impersonator. That's hilarious, really. <laughs> he builds himself, if you want to look him up, he builds himself as the Mayberry deputy. Oh he, has put, he has put three kids through college on this. He's made his entire living off of this. And when we used to work together, back in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, invariably when we worked together, people would remark on how much he looked like Don Knotts and Barney Fife. And David would always give it the quick, <laughs> and you know, we'd get, we'd get our laugh and we'd go on. And, uh, but then later on, he built an act with Don Knotts finally giving his blessing to this. And 
because you're not going to get Don Knotts to play Barney Fife, but if you want somebody to come to your sheriff's association or whatever, or, or police benevolent group or whatever, you, he's gone, you know, around the country. He does more dates than he, than he can possibly book in a year. And he's basically become like the Hal Holbrook of Mayberry uh, as being, you know, uh, the, and again, if you look up the Mayberry deputy, you'll, you'll go to his website, you'll see, you know, this is what has been his living uh, for all of these years. So, you know, television kindly shaped both of our careers after we stopped working together. Um, but we worked together for about uh, five years. And um, there, were, there were wonderful five years. There's a picture behind me hanging over the door. Um, I don't know if yeah, you can I, see it. But that, see it. Uh, that's a black and white picture. That's a, that was a live radio show we did in 1979 in Bristol, Tennessee, Virginia. And uh, that's, the, that's the two of us doing our act up there. And uh, so, you know, I, you know I, I've had my time, you know, of a sort of stand-up comedy. Uh, and I had a partner before that that I work with in New York. And uh, it's like I said, I can't imagine doing comedy without having the, the audience response. You know, I just can't, cannot imagine. I can imagine what it's like, you know. And even if it goes well, even if you think it's going wonderfully well, at the end, you're just going to shut off the Zoom and just go, well, that felt well, you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, I guess it went okay. But there's not that adrenaline. There's not that, that buzz that comes as you know, yeah, I do from know, making, and from making that connection, you know? imagine doing it through Zoom. I know I have friends that have Zoom comedy specials, and there's like four or five comedians on there, and I just don't want to participate just because, like you said, I feed off the audience, and I, if they say something, then maybe I can feed off of that and go from there and completely change my act to see what's going on in the audience. And so, yeah, I feed off the audience, and I just can't imagine doing it. No, I can't. And, 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 and again, you know, the comedy was my first love. Comedy was, because uh, when I grew up in New York and uh, I did it, you're still recording this. Are you going to use any of this? Yeah, <laughs> all of it. <laughs> you're I, kidding. I didn't realize. <laughs> Richard's going to stick around and watch three hours. <laughs> <laughs> I know. The only thing I realized, I was afraid that I was going to stop recording. So I entered it as a three hour meeting in Zoom. I didn't, and I, we're just talking and talking. I didn't even realize what time it was until you just said that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a danger of talking to me. It's, it really is a danger of interviewing me. Uh, but I, I grew up, uh, where I grew up, uh, and when I grew up, um, you know, there was no children's television uh, per se. You know, there was not, uh, there was no Disney Channel, there was no Nickelodeon. So what, Stations like WPIX, Channel 11, or, you know, uh, WOR, Channel 8, what they gave us for past for children's entertainment was basically the entertainment of our parents, and in some cases, our grandparents. And they gave us an awful lot of uh, comedy teams, you know. So the earliest influences for me were Abbott and Costello, Laurel and Hardy, and the Three Stooges, you know. It all begins there for me. Everything led off of that, you know. Uh, when I finally discovered the Marx Brothers, I saw my first Marx Brothers movie when I was seven years old. It wasn't even a very good one, it was room service. But I could tell there was something different. There was, I said, this is like pure oxygen or something. You know, this, is, this doesn't feel the way the others have felt. And I knew there was something, but I always jokingly would tell people I discovered the Marx Brothers late in life because I was seven years old when I saw my first Marx Brothers movie, which, which is only partly a joke because by seven, I had seen a fierce amount of Laurel and Hardy and Abbott and Costello and the, and, and the Three Stooges because it, they were on constantly on, 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 the, on, on afternoon television. And um, that led to horror because, you know, I, at seven years old, I also saw Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein and I was there for the Abbott and Costello half. I was not, could have cared less about the Frankenstein half. And then after watching, you know, getting into the old universal horror films, I remember seeing Son of Frankenstein and my father saying, you know, oh, that's Basil Rathbone. He played Sherlock Holmes, you know, Sherlock Holmes was that. And that led me to be interested in mystery in the, the mystery field. And all of a sudden I was watching, you know, Sherlock Holmes and other, and other mystery stories. And then you see that, and that was a very close pollination with, with the gangster movies. And then I was like, oh, you know, movies with Humphrey Bogart and, and Edward G. Robinson and Jimmy Cagney. And Cagney led me to musicals because of Yankee Doodle Dandy and 
Bogart led me to, you know, film noir. And it was, every, it was dominoes falling, is what I'm saying. Yeah. But the first thing that had to be tipped over, the first domino was comedy. You know, so I, I always say, you know, that for me, it all started with comedy. You know, uh, I've been able to sort of indulge all of my kind of interests with the books. You know, so there, there, is a, there is a Twilight Zone book and there is a Columbo book and there's a Mark Twain book and there's a the Night Stalker and such. I would love to do something like something on the Marx Brothers or something like that. Because or, or, it's, it's, the, it's the great unrecognized part of my life and is reflected in my books. Is I that, mentioned them because I was about the same age when I was first introduced to the Marx Brothers through my father. My father would show me all these movies. And as a kid, I would be laughing at the jokes. But then as I became an adult, I laughed for a different reason because of Groucho's double entendres and the things that they said back then. I, I'm laughing at one thing as, at seven and another thing at 22. That They yeah. were a great comedy team. And I mean, back I, I then, starting in vaudeville. Hate to say it. I mean, I really hate to say this. And I, you know, you're probably going to anticipate my punchline here. But, you know, one of the things that just utterly destroys me is my students have no idea who the Marx Brothers are. You know, for generation after generation, the Marx Brothers were a rite of passage. You know, you sort of adopted the Marx Brothers when you were a preteen, teen, young teen, and they were about rebellion. They were about anti-authority. And, you know, it was almost like uh, you reach an age and you, you, you had to get the Marx Brothers and W.C. Fields. And I say the Marx Brothers, I might as well be talking about leaders of the Russian Revolution now, as far as my students are concerned. They have no idea. And I say, even Groucho, iconically, they, they have no idea what I'm talking about. Here's and, what kills me, because I, I do the same thing with people that I talk to, and they're like, what are you talking about? And when I, this is what kills me when they're like, I wasn't born then. I said, I wasn't born during the Revolutionary War, but I know what happened. Just because, I mean, they're so close-minded of what happened before 1995 or before 1991 when they were born. Hmm. There's, I, I'm just the opposite. I, I'm very similar to you. I have very, very eclectic taste, and I'm not just stuck to one genre. I'm not, I, I love horror. I love comedy. I love drama. I love the classics. It's just there's too many things going on to just be stuck in rut in, in one kind of genre because you're missing out on so much music, you know, movies, literature. Well, you know, and, and I think that, you know, sometimes uh, fandoms, if you will, they almost get, stu get stuck in their own world. You know, they become so obsessive about one thing or one, even a, a subgenre. It's like, I've known people who will say to me, well, I love science fiction. I love science fiction. And I said, oh, yeah. What do you watch? Oh, I, I love Star Trek. You know? <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with Star Trek. Star Trek's yeah. a great show. There's nothing wrong with loving Star Trek. And again, all, the, all, of the, all of the values are correct. But when I say, you know, well, what else do you like? Well, no, 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 I like Star Trek. I'm a science fiction fan because I like Star Trek. Well, have you ever read Robert Heinlein? Have you ever read Arthur C. Clarke? Have you ever read Isaac Asimov? Have you ever, you know, uh, ventured into the works of Harlan Ellison or, 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 you know, other forms of science fiction like Philip K. Dick or something like that? No, I like Star Trek. <laughs> you know? And so, you know, it, it almost becomes like this, 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 they don't venture outside that world. It's like, well, Star Trek is meant to lead you to other places. That's the whole idea of Star Trek. It's, it, it, is a, it is a journey to other worlds. And the Star Trek is supposed to lead you. It's not supposed to begin and end with Star Trek. Star Trek is supposed to be a vehicle that gets you to other places. And if you have any curiosity in the world, you should, you should be going. And that is the problem. Um, it's not a lack of intelligence or smarts because people love to put down the millennials. And they love to, to care. They're, oh, they're lazy. Oh, they're, they're stupid. Oh, they're, 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 and they're none of those things. They're just, they're, that's just, you know, that's just old fartism, you know. But the one thing they are not, and it's not their fault, this has been done to them, is they do lack curiosity. Yes. And curiosity is the one thing which will get you places. More than anything else, more than intelligence, more than talent, curiosity is the thing that's going to carry you to great places in your life. 
You have to be curious. You have to ask. And my students are not curious. And I tell them this. I say, you're not curious. You know, that, like, for instance, in the class I teach, the film appreciation class I teach on vampires and film and TV, the first thing they see is Nosferatu because it's 1922 and it's the first major vampire film. Now for half the class, this movie represents everything they hate. It's black and white, it's old, it's foreign, it has subtitles, it's slow, it has no special effects. Um, but for the other half, and I always tell them, you don't have to like this movie. I'm not asking you to like it. You have to appreciate what it means in the history of film. But for the other half of the class, it is a transformative experience. They have never seen anything like it. And they'll say after, like, wow, that was amazing. You know? And that's where it stops. Not one student, now I've taught that class since 2009, twice a year. And in all that time, not one student has ever said, asked the question, which would have been the first question we would have asked at that age. Is there any more at home like you? What else is there? That was so good. What other, are there other movies like this? Are there other silent movies you can recommend? Oh, sure. And this is every day. I mean, I, in another class, and I, I show The Grapes of Wrath. And once again, half the class hates it because it's, it's long, it's boring, it's slow, it's talking. But the other half thinks it's a profoundly moving film. <coughs> And for most of them, it's their first John Ford movie. And it's their first Henry Fonda movie. Well, at that age, I would have was like, what other movies did John Ford make? What other movies did this Henry Fonda make? Can you recommend other movies? Oh, yeah, you've got to watch 12 Angry Men, Mr. Roberts, Young Mr. Lincoln, My Darling Clementine. I could, we're, we're going to be here for a while if you want to know what other Henry Fonda movies you could watch. They never asked that question. They never, as fired up as they are about what they're seeing, they never take that. And I think one of the reasons is they have grown up in an era of standardized tests, which is all about, tell me what I need to know to pass the test. It's not really about learning, it's about passing the test. And they become, you know, it's almost like, you know, seals learning to do the bicycle horns in the right order, and they get a cracker if they do it in the right order. And the cracker is great. You know, so, you know, at the end of the time, it's like, did I, did I do it right? Do I get my cracker? Do I get my grade? <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah, yeah, you did. But, you know, what did you learn? <laughs> you know, what, what did you learn? So they want to know what, what they need to know to pass the course. And um, that standardized test. And the other thing is that they've all been handed, you know, these things from age on. And, you know, and I, and, and I always tell them, I like mine just as much as you like yours but put them away, you cannot use them in class. I don't wanna see them, I don't wanna know them, and I roam, I'm not podium bound, I'm gonna be in your face if I see one of these out there. You know, but I said, you know, these things are phones. You know what you're supposed to do on a phone? You're supposed to talk, you're supposed to communicate. You don't even use this to talk. I said, you know it, you, what do you say to each other? You know, don't call me, text me. I know. And I said, and you think texting is new? I said, texting isn't new. The only thing we've changed is the delivery system. I said, we used to do, to communicate the exact same way in the smallest number of characters, dots and dashes. We called it the telegraph. It's how we communicated in the 1840s. You guys are communicating the way people communicated in the 1840s. It's just that we're not stringing wire from town to town. We're just doing it this way. So I said, you know, you're, 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 you're not talking in complex thoughts and you're not writing in complex thoughts you've reduced communication to nonverbal, and 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 you reduce writing down to the the, the least number of characters <coughs> well, well i i talked to a teacher and she said that they were they had to reintroduce communications back into the classroom because kids didn't know how to talk to each other yeah and i think Come that's true I think yeah. that, that's absolutely true. When you spend your whole life like this, you know, I mean, my students always get tired of the, the parable of the tree, but, you know, I, every class gets it, which is, I, I, I say to them, you know, um, 
I, te I teach in a, a building on the Kent State campus called Franklin Hall. And I say to my students, you know, I'm just noticing something tonight. You know, I notice it every time I walk into Franklin Hall. I said, you know, there's this, that, that gorgeous evergreen tree, that huge evergreen tree outside of Franklin Hall. I said, it's beautiful every season. It's beautiful in the winter when it is bedappled with snow. It's beautiful in the spring when the spring winds blow it one way and the other. It's beautiful in the summer against the dazzling blue summer sky. And it's beautiful in the fall when it is surrounded by all the explosion of brown and orange and red colors all around it. And I look up at them and I realize they're all thinking the same thing. What tree? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I said, you guys don't even know what tree I'm talking about. You pass it every single day, but you pass it like this coming into class. I said, you're going to be four years at Kent State University, and somebody's going to say, oh, Kent State, that's a pretty campus, isn't it? And you're going to say, um, I, I, I think so. so. Oh, you know, you'll be able to tell them about the cracks in the sidewalk. <laughs> but you never, you, you literally are not looking up. It's its, its own metaphor. I'm so you know, glad that I'm at least the age I am. I'm so glad that I grew up in a time where the only time they can, people can get in touch with you is if you were home because there was no such thing as answer machines. You had a rotary phone that was on the wall that, of the kitchen. And if, it, if you picked it up, you were able to talk to them. There, I, I actually loved living, loved living like that. I'm so glad that I had a chance a little bit to experience playing outside, having fun, ha unlocking the doors to imagination. <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you the one thing that, you know, we had as a great advantage that these that generations after us did not. This is where they were really penalized. We had a thing growing up, and people always put down the three network universe thing. Well, there were only three networks, they controlled everything, and, and that's true. But, you know, we lost the shared experience when the three networks went away. We lost the notion that we were all in the same living room. And because of that, we shared our cultures. We did that through what we called the variety show. Yes. And something as banal as the Ed Sullivan show. Think of how many people were introduced to jazz, rhythm and blues, uh, you know, all kinds of ballet, opera because in any given hour of the ed sullivan show all of that was there <clears throat> it had old vaudeville performers up and coming stand-up performers new rock acts lounge singers ballet broadway numbers yeah. opera and you got a chance to see all that now that didn't mean you liked it but maybe you saw ray charles on the ed sullivan show and you went hey what is this all about you know, or maybe you heard an old jazz artist like Art Tatum and you went, wow, you know, how are you going to find it now? And that created curiosity. If you grew up in that era, your head was sort of on a swivel. You were looking at the entertainment of the past because you were being exposed to it. You say, oh, you know, I, I kind of like this, 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 this thing, you know. You were looking at the entertainment of today saying, wow, look at what's, what's coming on. You know, here are the doors on, on, on the Ed Sullivan show. Here's, you know, you know, the who or whatever. And you were also looking up ahead to the future. What's coming up? What's going to be around the corner? And now, you know, the, since the 90s, popular music, they don't even take it with them. A year or two after something is pop, it's gone. You know, it's, 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 there, it's, it's only the entertainment of the moment. And then that doesn't last. I think a big problem with that is because that's when, it was even before that, when kids like, you know, new kids in the block and sync, they would get four or five kids that looked alike, sounded alike, danced alike, talked alike. And then when that died out, they get four brand new kids who sounded alike, talked alike, danced alike, sung alike. You keep, the bands like the Beatles, for example, that would start off with Love, Love Me Do and end up with Sgt. Peppers. You can never see a band change that drastically without somebody going, forget that. I'm done with them. They were able to be, you know, tra um, transform over 20 years or however many years that they weren't together, 20 years. But still, you know, they, they always say, that, you know, the 20 year overnight success. You can't have that anymore. No. 
And it's why groups from the, um, you know, the 60s and 70s can still tour. You know, what's left of the Rolling Stones can still tour. You know, the Eagles can still tour. What group from 2003 tours? You know, what group from, you know, you know 20 years ago tours? Um, you know, it, it's, 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 there's no loyalty to it. You know, it's just, it's just, well, okay, you know, this is what's popular right now. And also for uh, musicians, oh, geez, music, I mean, can you imagine um, with everything having gone digital and there's no economic base for it? I mean, you know, the model for musicians, and even that got destroyed in the last few months, was, was, was actually going out and playing on weekends and selling your CDs. You know, it was the only way maybe you make 40, 50 bucks over the weekend, to, you know, so you can go out next weekend and do it again. And, uh, you know, the, the economic model for musicians has just been, been horrendous. Um, and, and so there's that too, you know, is that uh, there's the whole idea you could graduate to making albums and maybe have a career, uh, you know, and, and be paid a, a living wage for it. And now the only people are making a living wage are, it's like, well, it's, it's like writers, you know, the, the, the big superstar writers are making all the money and then they're paying almost nothing to down here and the middle list has gone away. That, that was the working advances for writers who might write one or two books every couple of years and would live off that. Yeah. And you know, that's gone, you know, it's, 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 so we're going to go back to the 1800s. What we're doing is we're going back to a model where, uh, if you want to make music or you want to paint, or you want to be a writer, you probably have to have a subsistence job. You probably have to have a day job, the way actors do. The way, you know, everybody's gonna become like actors where actors have to drive a cab or wait on tables or have another job. That's what's gonna happen with writers and, and other people in the arts. Because we're, you know, that's, we've destroyed the economic model for them. And uh, you say, you know, you're glad your age. Let me tell you how glad I am I was born in, you know, 1956. Yeah, because you know I got a forty-three year writing career out of it, um, which is I wouldn't have had if I had a you know I would be, you know, uh, if if I were twenty years younger right now I'd be thinking about how do am I going to reinvent myself so I can get twenty more working years out of this. So, you know, yeah. I've actually said in the past I said I told my parents I said I wish I was your age and they're like don't wish your wife what life away so I'm not wishing my life away but I just like what you just said i think the way things are going it's so much tougher to stay afloat. oh yeah you yeah, you, so. you know you're gonna have to do it for the love of it you know because you're probably not going to get fairly uh recompensed for it and that's too bad i mean you know it's like i said in, hey look in the 1800s there was only a couple of writers who made so much money that they could live lavishly and build big mark twain was one charles dickens was another almost all the other writers we know from the 1800s had other jobs, you know, all Melville, you know, Hawthorne, they all, they, they, they taught, they worked at universities, they worked in local parishes, whatever they did, they had what we would call today day jobs. And, and it supported them writing for other things. We're, we're going to go back to that. We're the, we're, we've already have gone back to it, quite frankly. And for people who want to write now, it's like, well, you're probably not going to make enough to, to, for it to be your living. You know, maybe that was just a 20th century moment for us. Maybe that was just a, the whole idea of being a working writer uh, was more just for the 20th century. I don't know. You know but it's, it, 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 it's, it's, it's definitely more challenging now than it ever has been before. Yeah. And on that note... <laughs> Mark, it's been great talking to you. And I'm definitely going to have you back in the show. I'm going to buy the Kolchak book and the Colombo book. I know we talked a lot about Colombo already, but Kolchak. Let me put it this way. Wait, wait, wait. You'll buy the Colombo book because this is easily got now on Amazon and it's reprinted and it's, it's in this beautiful new edition. You will get this. Um, you will not get this. It is very difficult to find. It is. Okay. It, it was published in 1997. However, I am thinking of updating and revising this. You know, 2020 will be the 50th anniversary of the first movie. So, you know, perhaps I'll do, and if, if, if things work out, always a big if, because as you, I already told you, if I tell you I'm going to do it, 
the universe will just say, oh, no, you're not. Um, but there's a, there's a good chance um, I'll revise this. And then it will be available, like the Colombo book, for a decent price. But this will be a very difficult book to find. Uh, what about night stalking? Same. Oh, even more, even worse. It had a it had a lower print run. That one's okay. even more expensive if you if you uh, if you go looking for it. This would be, this will be the easier find actually of the two, and it'll be That's cheaper true. if you find it because it's lesser less of a collector's item, and it's a more complete version. It's a much more complete version of the story, but it needs to be revised. It, Let's it, keep it, it a secret from the universe. You're not going to do that, are you? Let's tell the universe you're not going to do it because I want to see that. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't matter what I say. It does not, you know, like I said, that's one of my lessons from the Twilight Zone, isn't it? Uh, it does not matter what I say. Um, and, and it's just too unpredictable. Yeah, and, you know, and, and a lot of it depends on how well and how quickly the Poe research goes. You know? and when's that book coming out? Well, I need to deliver it in October. And then it will be printed the following October. Because this is this is for St. Martin's and major publishers go very slow, you know. So um, they need a year between you delivering the manuscript and the actual book appearing. So the target date for delivering the manuscript is October, and then the publication will be October 2022. Okay. So where can people find you? Uh, there, I have a website, which is markdewitziak.com. Uh, it's real tricky. It's just my name.com. Um, <laughs> I'm on Facebook. Uh, yeah. and, I, and I'm a pretty active Facebooker. I, I, I like Facebook and uh, um, I post often. And, um, and I, there's a, our theater company, the Largely Literary Theater Company, has a Facebook page as well. So uh, any one of these ways is a good way to, to, to get in touch with me. I'm a, a very easily found person. <laughs> We probably talked for at least over three hours, three and, three yes. and a half hours. I could probably talk for another three hours because you, you're so interesting and you have so many things to say. So thank you very much for being a guest on the Claus Corner. I really oh, do appreciate my pleasure. it. Thank you. And, and, any, and any excuse to, to, to spend some time with Anne, even uh, long distance, is, 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 is a good one. Because she's, oh, yeah. she's one of the great people of the universe. I could tell. I'm so glad that I had a, had, had a chance to have both of you on the show. So that wraps up another episode of the Claws Corner of the Zoom Edition. I would like to thank my guest, Ann Serling and Mark Dwidziak, for a fun and interesting conversation on one of my all-time favorite shows, The Twilight Zone, and much, much more later on after Ann left. So keep up the great work, both of you, for introducing the world to Rod, of Rod Serling to this generation and many generations to come. I would also like to thank you, the viewer, for tuning in. Enjoy your day, everyone.